Well, we've just started the lower slopes of the second climb of the day. We've just heard the news that Tom Vilas has now abandoned the tour. We're down to 164 riders. Tom Vilas in his first Tour de France, Paul. That's where we are, heading up at the second climb. Yeah, got over the first one, down across the valley quite quickly, and now we're starting this next climb of the day. The final big uh, hardship on the day, the Col du Granier, a first category climb. Yes, but it's a beautiful day. There's our climb statistics for you. Just under 10 kilometres long. That's just under six miles in length. And a long way to go when we get over the top today. So the riders know that this isn't quite as crucial as before. As we fall away from the picture of the Mont Granier, you are now looking to the riders who are now climbing the Col du Granier. These are the leaders. They've been strengthened by the arrival up front of Igor Martinez from Uskatel Uskadi. He wasn't part of the original breakaway. He's crossed the gap himself. Happy faces in the sun and the trees of the Col du Granier. They've uh, started to take a natural break in the main field will now give a bit of an advantage to this leading group of five riders and that's the reason why David Miller was going hard on the descent. He understands the sport. Tactically he knew that if he could just keep the pressure on for another minute or another two minutes they would sit up behind. Well what is likely to happen is that uh, these are the five leaders. David Miller on the far right uh, swinging round on the inside and coming to the back. He started this move by descending like a stone off the Col du Grenier and I'm pretty sure we can expect to see Sagan's little group get across shortly all right well the London Olympics begin on the NBC and the networks of the NBC Universal on July 27th and VP is a proud partner of the US Olympic Committee supporting a diverse group of Team USA athletes let's take a closer look at a day in the life of one of these athletes and for an extended look go to universalsports.com Two Liquigas teammates in that chasing group at a minute and 28 seconds. But what I've just noticed is that the front end of the peloton, Orica Greenedge is starting to get themselves organised because they can see that being a very, very dangerous move for their man, Matty Goss. Which means that Matt Goss hasn't been dropped with the other sprinters today, although that was a group of riders who were off the back with Daniel Hondo sat in it just there. Looking down at the peloton, though, they're disappearing for a moment. I hope we come out and see us again shortly. Well, there we are with the leaders. We're going through the uh, forest area, forested area here is known as the area of the Grand Chartreuse and those gorges back there were the gorges of Gruyere which is the small river and separating the two departments as you mentioned Phil from the Rhone into the Isère. Coming down to the right with on this long long uh, very ordinary descent for these riders quite safe no big switchbacks and hairpin nonetheless the peloton stretching along here the breakaway themselves being driven on Egoi Martin has pushing the pace and the front of the breakaway. 127 kilometers still to go but they're keeping a very respectable pace up for the longest stage of the tour there we are there's the teammate of Peter Sagan driving at the front as uh, they push on Peter Sagan just sitting on the back waiting to be carried up to that leading group today Looking at the chase group here at 127 kilometres, it looks to me as though we've got Frank Schleck in that little group. Paul, was that the wrong number? Or Popovich. Again? Popovich coming back from the front. I misread his number. There's uh, Christophe Perrault and uh, this is Kizakowski as we join the leaders. So the row down, way down, heading to the far south now, but of course eventually it'll be the Pyrenees. On this beautiful monastery of the Grand Chartreuse here, it's part of the massif of the Chartreuse, and the biggest mountain here stands at 2,026 metres above that monastery. Isn't it absolutely magnificent? As we join the action here, we've left the monastery behind the leaders now as they continue to work pretty hard at the front. We're actually looking here at the chase group. This is Izagir of Uskadel Uskadi, his teammate Igor Martinez is up in the front group. Two Uskadel boys on the attack. There's only five left in the team of nine. They've lost four riders, including their Olympic champion Samuel Santes. Most dropping out with accidents on this Tour de France. This is uh, a situation that is developing at the back now because this Ready is news the chase group. You've got number 57, Peter Sagan. He's trying to bridge a gap of around 1 minute and 35 seconds uh, to get up to that leading group of five. If they do join, there'll be a group of 14 in the front. 
Davy Miller of Garmin Sharp and Scotland on the front of the break here Jean-Christophe Perrault willing to work through and push on the mountain biker he's shown great form this year in the Tour de France always in the action but unfortunately over the first week he was involved like many many riders in the accidents and uh, crashes that happened and abounded and he lost himself a fair amount of time so he's not really been able to consolidate on the performance that he had last year which, which gave him a very high finish in his first participation at the Tour de France and he finished ninth overall but the big surprise Phil that's him sitting at the back wearing number 71 the big surprise was when he popped into road racing from mountain biking and thought let me have a go at the French National Time Trial Championships and Sylvain Chavanel had been so dominant in that discipline and this man came up and whacked them all and got himself the title yes uh, Chavanel's got it back now by the way but uh, even so uh, yes he is tremendous bike rider and mountain biker that's following a trend these last 10 years or oh, mountain bikers showing the road cyclists how they can quickly transfer not least of course Cadell Evans who was an absolutely outstanding mountain bike until he turned road pro uh, after the 2000 Olympics in Sydney and got himself uh, a lead in the uh, Giro d'Italia pink jersey to boot although he uh, crumbled under the pressure on that occasion but he was a very young professional when he did that now he's a seasoned professional he knows how to handle his body and a lot of people are not uh, saying that we should discount Cadell Evans because this last week of the race for once we get into the Pyrenees is going to be difficult well Dave Miller you just saw him roll his bottle away gently to the public as he didn't want it he's been doing most of the work our computer saying 31% at the front but he was the rider who attacked alone coming away from the Granier and then uh, Jean-Christophe Perrault is the second big workhorse in that breakaway they must be aware now though that there is a chasing group of nine men trying to reach them and there's some big names back there big names on reputation not big names on the destiny of the yellow jersey of the Tour de France yeah but I think because of the presence of Peter Sagan in that group those guys are working like maniacs in that leading group of five to make sure that Sagan doesn't come back to rejoin them because if he comes back they know there's hardly any chance of a victory left no because he sprints at the moment Sargon's major aim is to get on the front before we have the race for the points along the road which is 20 points for the win he's still a way to go yet though I must say uh, before he gets that time is still on his side for Peter Sargon long thin line of the peloton now they're running at around about uh, three minutes 20 seconds behind the lead group which includes uh, Scotland's David Miller at the moment the chase group of Peter Sagan is about a minute 37 back another lovely town as they're welcome through the town The banners are out, the buntings are out today, Saint Laurent Dupont. Uh, Sagan here sitting at the back, and the goodness knows why, because the group has ridden away from him just for the moment. Out in the front are the leaders here now leaving the town and heading on towards the town of Marchilol, which is where the sprint is today. And it comes at around about 45 miles from the finish today. Stage 12 today, we head on to a new finish in Anoy, Ananoy, Anane, and it is a long way of 140 miles today. It really is a long way, so welcome to everybody in the East Coast. A little bit earlier by three hours on the West Coast, and yes, I know you guys in Hawaii keep reminding me, but you're just about starting your night. Well, welcome and thanks for staying with the action. This is the 12th day. It's been a great race over the first two climbs, but as we expected, the peloton have regrouped basically, leaving just five riders out front and none of those five riders affecting for the moment the overall destiny of the yellow jersey Igor Martinez is the best placed up front he's 20 minutes and 53 seconds at behind and Kizilowski who won both of the climbs he's next best placed at 28 minutes now we've just been through the feeding station the blue knife and fork there we're heading to the sprint there was an audacious attack by Peter Sagan to try and reach these five leaders uh, but the Orica Green Edge who have their man in second place in the green jersey Matthew Goss they chased and they swept him up uh, the one sad aspect of the day stage was the loss to the race of the Cofidis rider David Moncoutier uh, he crashed on the descent of the Col de Coucheron and there he is sitting down there. he broke down in tears just after that shot because it was to be his last Tour de France his 11th Tour de France indeed and it's the only one he has never finished and he's also won two stages uh, during his career at the end of this year he will retire from the sport a really sad end to him
for the Tour de France. There's the man who's increased his lead ever so slightly yesterday over everybody, including his teammate Chris Froome, Bradley Wiggins. There's a nice uh, dizzy view. Have you ever been in a helicopter, Paul, when they do this, flying right close to the mountains? It makes you feel seasick. I certainly have. I did it once in the island of the Reunion, and we came over the top of this cliff, and there was a drop immediately going down 2,000 metres. I nearly jumped out of my seat. Fortunately, I was strapped in at the time. I wanted a four-day mountain bike race on Hawaii, and I know there's a lot of viewers listening to us from Hawaii. And uh, I had a guy called Joe who had come back from the Vietnam War, and I think he was still flying that helicopter like he was attacking everybody. He went right up against the rocks with his rotors. He said, this will be a great shot. We had a cameraman strapped on the outside. And he rose up the mountain as the riders went around it. And slowly but surely, you saw the whole line of riders in the mountain bike race. But those rotors, I guarantee, were not a metre from the wall of that mountain. A good helicopter pilot is worth uh, lots and lots in this day and age. I have to say, I had an email from somebody complaining of having to get up at 6 o'clock in the morning on the West Coast <laughs> to watch our coverage. And a bloke wrote back to me and said, well, I'm in Hawaii and I'm getting up at 3 a.m. in the morning Absolutely. to watch the event. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the breakaway is still clear and it's going up now. This might be settling down for a long chase later and David Miller is in it. Three minutes, 25 seconds, just gone up two seconds as I speak. It's been a tough breakaway to establish because of the counter moves behind, but it's now settling down. Frank Schleck is back at his team car. He's feeling uh, happier and happier. In fact, yesterday, funnily enough, last night, uh, Frank Schleck was saying uh, Bradley Wiggins was telling uh, Chris Froome to slow down on the climb yesterday. Frank Schleck was going through a bad period, and as soon as he heard Bradley Wiggins say slow down, he felt a lot better himself. Well, that was TJ Van Garderen chatting there in the white jersey with uh, with Cadell Evans. I'm not sure whether you could hear what he was saying. I couldn't, but it's, uh, he looks in good spirits, doesn't he, Cadell? Despite the fact that I think yesterday he's probably lost his best shot at winning this year's Tour de France, but he still could finish on the podium. Well, you know, Phil, this race can turn around on any day. We saw Bryce Fellu over the first week sitting at the back end of the main field. And in the mountains, he was on the attack. We saw uh, Luis Leon Sanchez sitting last man for a week of racing, and he's been in the breakaway on two separate occasions. Cadell Evans, yes, I'm sure he had a very bad day yesterday, but he's a seasoned professional bike rider. He knows he can bounce back, and he knows he can have good days once we get into the Pyrenees. Yeah, it, people say a, good, a bad time in the Alps means a good time in the Pyrenees. Let's find out next week. Another beautiful village here, this time in the department of the Isère now, which is one of the famous French rivers in this department as the riders now head towards the department of the Drôme, a peloton under the escort of Team Sky beneath Blue Skies. As Bradley Wiggins, a second rider through there. A lot of different teams on the front, uh, that's a good sign that nobody's really interested. The gap is now over 11 minutes. I need to push on a little bit more because once they do start to race, of course, the time does tumble down. Uh, we're inside 90 kilometres to go now to the finish. New Gilbert has put himself right on the front. Uh, Paul Sherwin's tip to win today. Maybe so, is still a way to go. On the left of the picture is Michael Rogers. Puffing and blowing in the black in the centre is Richie Port. And this is the yellow jersey, of course, of Bradley Wiggins. So there they are now all lining through the crowd enjoying the moment so uh, they won't be the half of the crowd will be saying well we could ride as fast as that round to France but of course this is a rare moment when the pressure is off it was a different case yesterday when we saw a superb day of bike racing uh, with all of the favorites uh, attacking at some stage or other and that's a great bike race they still have to complete the distance. Looking resplendent in the polka dot jersey on the right there is the leader of that competition, which is Frederick Kisirkov. And I think we're just looking at the world champion there going at the outside, uh, and that's Mark Cavney. So he's had a long ride back. He had to be brought back with uh, by Bernard Isel, but there he is, 103. You know, if he came down to a bunch sprint, he wouldn't be slumbering around the back of the big bunch. So he'll wait for the moment and see how this develops. He's hoping to take a gold medal in London in the Olympic road race. He'll start favourite there for sure. Now just a little stop there for Danilo Hondo. He's pulled back as uh, Mark Cavendish moved right through. 
big day out at the moment and this is uh, Carsten Kroon 173 I haven't seen too much of Carsten had an up and a down uh, ride chance to see 171 there many viewers won't have seen him before that's Jonathan Cantwell the Queenslander riding his first Tour de France and this one I was going to tell you all about him we've gone to the front of the peloton now quite a silent uh, Quite a silent peloton. Let's have a look at the leaders. Here they are. And right on the front, doing all of the work, is David Miller. The man who has won three stages in history. But he's always said that the stage he really enjoyed winning was the one road race stage he won in Bézier in 2002 in the colours of Cofidis. That was a long breakaway and it was a beautiful day and Miller really counted that one because at this point everybody talked to David Miller purely as a time trialist. He's 35 now, he's just been named for the London Olympic Games, he's part of the British team there. He's in his 11th Tour de France. His other stages, by the way, were time trials. They came at Futuroscope in 2000 and in Nantes in 2003. OK, well, it's time to see what you've been doing overnight. Let's have a look at our Road ID Challenge fan predictions uh, here. Who you think of it? Wow, 70% agree with me. Peter Sagan today. Uh, Cadell Evans, 30%. David Miller might spoil the party for us, guys. Vincenzo Nibali, 7. And Chris Froome, 7. No, it's not tilly enough for those two. Uh, but Sagan, a very good choice if we all come back together again. And that's beginning to look as though it may not be the case today. That's, uh, don't forget, go on over to roadid.com forward slash ride and make your prediction for tomorrow sprinters tomorrow listen to me sprinters tomorrow so the peloton winding its way towards the finish for the first time in Anane today 11 minutes 47 Paul we're heading up to 12 minutes and that was the other mark we just set them and they get that now yeah but it's, uh, it all depends now what the other teams decide to do because with the return of a couple of sprinters it could be quite interesting on the running towards the finish Andre Greipel has come back after a long long chase with Mark Cavendish Cadell Evans wearing number one he's just sitting in the main field with his teammates are trying to get his head together for the next assault the final week of the tour just a little touch on the shoulder there so excuse me I'm coming by my name's Cadell Evans you might not know <laughs> me but I'd like to introduce myself the first time I've seen you at the back Cadell nobody ever comes down here to see me was what the other guy said 11.44, 11.45 as we continue. Flattish roads, undulations, but flattish roads now. There's all the boys in black uh, doing their job so well. The NBC Sports Network is your home for Olympic soccer, featuring the US Women's Quest for a third consecutive gold medal in the Olympic Games. Coverage begins July 25th, leading up to the opening ceremony. That's July 27th on NBC looking forward to the opening ceremony to see how London show us the best side of the city these are the leaders uh, David Miller number 66 three stage wins in history this is number 188 and this is Robert Kizilowski we'll take a break second on the stage of the Tour de France to the champion of Australia in this race Simon Gerrans at uh, Prato Novoso and there's the names for you, 23% work rate largely being done by the top left rider there. So as we see these riders heading up towards the top spin, one man we will see in the action, I'm sure, will be Matthew Goss. He's racing the sixth place at the next spin point. He was talking this morning with Craig Hummer. Matt, today the, the stage we leave the Alps might be seen as an opportunity for you and your team. Yeah, look, it can definitely be an opportunity. We've got a bunch of good guys that can follow and go in the breakaways, and uh, if it is a break that's big and uh, we've got the right guys in it, then yeah, it definitely could go to the finish, and hopefully we've got a guy that can finish it off, and if it does come back for a sprint, then uh, you know it's a stage that potentially you know, I, I can have a good one on it. It's, it's going to be a tough little finish, you know, with the, the two climbs in the start, plus a climb in the final, and an uphill drag the last two or three k's, so it's going to be one we just have to wait and see there's a few different scenarios for today. You mentioned sprinting, and of course that leads me into the green jersey discussion. To use an Australian term, you are one heck of a battler, and I don't think this is over by any means. How, though, would you rate where you are right now and your chances with a little over a week to go on the tour? Yeah, look, well, I'd like to be a little bit closer. I made a couple of little mistakes, you know, one stage finish and one intermediate, but, uh, you know, Sagan's been unfortunate with the crash. But, look, we're 27-odd points behind now, and uh, on the flat days and the good days, I was taking about 10 to 12 points a day, and there's three flat stages left, so that equals more than 30 points, and... Uh, you know the gaps less than that so we're definitely going to keep fighting all the way and if we can keep chipping away then hopefully you know it can be a real close one when we come to Paris 
when you and I get a chance to talk on these days, you, you always have a smile on your face. How much do you enjoy that fight that we just talked about? Yeah, look, it's great. You know, that's why, why we do this sport. We love it. It's competition. You love trying to win, and uh, there's no better satisfaction than winning. So, uh, you know, we've got to get out there and try and do it again today. All right, yes, Matthew Goss from Tasmania in Australia. He's a real toughie, believe me, and he loves getting in amongst it. We should see him in action very shortly. He needs to get those 10 points on offer from the bunch, and he, I'm sure he's going to take on uh, Peter Sagan as well as possibly Mark Cavendish. We're almost at the green S, which is the point of contention. We'll take the leaders through, but I don't think we're going to see a sprint finish for them because that 20 points isn't going to really help out with the 200 plus that Goss and uh, Sagan has got. But we'll also, of course, see the peloton sprint as well. You bet we will. That'll be a fabulous sprint finish. Just sat at the back here is Michael Shaw. Michael Shard of Team BMC just slipping back. He's been a terrific workhorse on the BMC racing team of Cadell Evans. Always willing to work at this point in the race. But he's gone back, I would think, to get a few bottles now for the riders out front. That will be the order of the day now up until uh, 20 kilometres to go. Five to 10 kilometres to go for the uh, riders in the main field. Mm -hmm. And there will be a sprint fill even though it is only 10 points available. Oh, yes. Because that race, that competition for the green jersey for the most consistent rider in the sprints could very well go right the way down to the Champs-Élysées. We're looking in the eyes. One kilometre to go now for the leading five riders at the sprint on the way. This is Marshall Lull and uh, I'm not too sure that these leaders with a lead of 11 minutes plus will take part in the sprint their ambition is a little bit further down the road today because this uh, is 73 kilometers from the finish of the stage and David Miller is looking to take these four riders with him to the finish today well that's the idea and I don't think there will be a sprint coming from this group because what happens when you've got a, a workman like group like this if somebody sprints out of the pack it tends to break the rhythm and it's hard to get yourself all organized once again so you normally will just keep riding through and the first guy to cross the line gets the money because more importantly is the prize at the end of the day that's right there's none of these riders uh, affecting the destiny of the green jersey it was won by Mark Cavendish last year he became the first British rider to win it Mark said right out at the start of the Tour de France he wasn't going to defend his green jersey because of the upcoming Olympic Games might take a little bit too much energy out of him so it's a battle just now between Peter Sagan and Matt Goss and they are 232 points plays 205 points expect them to come right to the fore even though they will only be sprinting for sixth place there will be 10 points available for them yeah just the other day Matty Goss pulled back five points on Peter Sagan he will continue to do that till we get right the way to the Champs-Élysées and he will continue to chip away at that points competition looks like uh, maximum points and the money in the bag is going to go to David Miller in the blue jersey there so he's going to take an extra 1500 euros home 11-11 so they're holding but they're not chasing back yet they just lifted the tempo they decided to peg it at 11 minutes as far as the breakaway is concerned uh, so we'll see if they start to run it down 72 minutes at the moment at the 72 kilometers rather it looks to me as though it's going to be a tight finish today Paul this could all happen in the last couple of kilometers well everybody always says why do these guys go into the breakaway they go into the breakaway because they believe that they are going to survive Peloton seems to be running very very quickly over the field over the uh, ground there though doesn't it at the moment so let's have a look at this beautiful palace this is called the ideal palace of the factor cheval which in english means the palace of the postman who was called cheval and uh, he even built his own mausoleum afterwards what a wonderful building that is we'll take a break and rejoin us for the sprint partially crowded and as they said that the sun just came out on the finishing line Just a little bit of the break up on the pictures. We apologize for that, it's all out of our control. Meanwhile, we are with Cyril Gauthier at the team car in Europe car in the leading breakaway. And he's just checking on the gap. But it's good news, it's not yet inside 11 minutes and we are only 68 kilometers from the finish. So Paul Show in one minute every 10 kilometers on the catchback. It looks as though they might win. 
Well, theoretically, yes, but I'm waiting to see what it's going to be at about 40 kilometers to go, because then if it's about seven to eight minutes with 40 kilometers to go, they've got a very good chance of survival. Mm -hmm. It also depends on which team decides to chase. So right now, everybody seems very happy to leave all of the pace making up to Team Sky. They're quite happy to set a tempo. They don't want to pull the breakaway back, but they just want to peg it and make sure that it doesn't get to an astronomical am amount. No passengers in the leading group. They're all doing a little bit of pacemaking at the front while the other guys get a rest and then they swing off and move round. This time it's Igor Martinez. Nice close-up. He goes through and scurries past David Miller. The peloton and on the right now are the Orica Green Edge riders. They will be looking to lead out Matthew Goss for the sprint and uh, it looks as though they're up in number as well. And Peter Sagan, I think he's in the teams on the... He's shaded on the left side as we look. Yeah, back on Soleil also moving up to the front, so they will get involved with the sprint if they can there. You can just see Pepe in the middle in the rainbow jersey, the white jersey with the bands around the middle, that's Mark Cavendish. I doubt if he will get involved in this, but he may well just have a little try to stretch out his legs after a tough day in the mountains. Yes, uh, Mark Cavendish is playing the imp, I think. He just likes to spoil it for everybody else uh, because he's no longer... A re he is in fourth place, but he's, he's out of the hunt for the final victory. He's got 129 points against Sagan's 232. I think, realistically, Matt Goss is the only one that can disturb the rhythm of Peter Sagan. And when we've come to these mid-race sprints, Paul, Goss has always seemed to get one over on Sagan. When we get to the finish, it's Sagan that gets it over on Goss. Well, it depends on the kind of sprint. I think in pure speed, Matty Goss is faster than Peter Sagan, but Peter Sagan has had a number of climbs that suit his ability, especially over the opening few days of the Tour de France, when the stages were finishing at the top of some rather steep climbs, too steep for some of the pure sprinters like Matty Goss. Well, here's the peloton, and they're just going past three kilometres from that sprint now, so we're inside two miles to the line. Having a little chat at the back here is Alexander Vinokurov, along with uh, Frank Schleck. They don't care about the green jersey sprint, they don't care about the day sprint, they just care about finishing. Well, Frank Schleck seems uh, a lot happier than he has been over the first part of this event. Uh, he lost uh, any chance of a repeat of his podium when he was stopped by a crash on what was basically the last of the flat stages on the road down into Metz, and he lost, I think, on that occasion pretty close to two minutes and put him way down in the overall standings. Bernard Eisel, the workhorse, always looking for the whereabouts of Mark Cavendish without him at the moment. There's Cavendish in the white jersey just passing through our picture. George Hincapi back in the frame with Team BMC in his 17th Tour de France, a drink for the oldest man in the race, Jens Voigt, always at the sharp end of the peloton. Well, he was on the attack very early on, Jens Voigt, looking to try and get himself into that breakaway. He had the knowledge and knew that that breakaway was going to succeed. He got into a breakaway group to try and bridge, but the main field were not allowing a big group to form at the front end of the race here this afternoon. One kilometre to go now for the peloton, and uh, watch out now, Mark Cavendish is not far away from the front of this peloton. It's the Orica Green Edge boys as well, looking for Mac Goss, and Sagan is also inching forward. Well, also, uh, Kenny Van Hummel over to the right-hand side for Vacon Soleil. He's thinking about the possibility there. You can see the red and black jerseys. That's the teammates of Cadell Evans. They won't get involved in this sprint, but they want to stay near the front end of the pack just to make sure they don't get involved in any contretemps. Well, I think Kenny Van Hummel is urging the Vacon Soleil team there. They are easing out of the saddle. He is sitting overall in this competition, a little way off the pace, uh, Kenny Van Hummel, but he, he does like to take part in the sprint. And we're off, and it is Kenny Van Hummel's squad who has started. That's uh, caused a reaction on the right of the road. Sagan's in a very good place. He's third of the three men on the right. It's only ten points at the line. He's just dropped back to fourth now as uh, they continue up the line. They're closing in on the riders and back on Soleil. But that is a serious spin that's been opened up, and now they're coming for him. The acceleration as they go after him, and Goss is going to go for this one. Again, Sagan is a little bit loose coming out of the pack. Rifle on the line gets second. Again, he outwits Sagan when it matters. Well, it uh, looks to me as if Peter Sagan just got himself into third position there when he lunged his bike for the line, yep. and the other rider should have been Kenny Van Hummel. Have a look at this one more time. That's the Vacon Soleil rider making the lead out there, but look at the response coming down the left right hand gutter there from uh, Matty Goss. Greipel gets into the slipstream of Matty Goss at this point and says, Now nah, I'm going to just see if I can come by you. I haven't got it with me today. Oh, the lunch for the line. You know, Sagan was actually fourth. Well, we'll wait and see. It looked like he might have snicked it, but who knows? We'll, we'll tell you when the computer tells us. But the most important thing is it's a couple of points more taken back for Matty Goss, and again. 
if he could produce that sprint at the finishing line he'd have been a stage winner here this week no certainly uh, this man though starting to take an interest in the green jersey he's a strong rider look at the scars down the uh, left hand leg there of uh, Andre Greipel and the bandaged elbow there's a lot of riders in this bike race Phil look as if they've been to the wars well, there's 32 points between Greipel and uh, Goss he just lost a couple of more there Still no sign of the result. We can have another li little look at it, I think. As the sprinters re go, re re uh, group there at the front. Just take a look at this again. I don't know why Sagan gives Matt Goss such a long advantage here. It looked as though the lead out was for Kenny Van Hummel. As he really looked with a speed like that, he won it. But look how quickly Matt Goss takes a charge. And Sagan was a bit slow to react around his teammate, Daniel Oss. And then Goss kicks on. Greipel's on his wheel. Sagan tries to get in and be third. And you know, he may have got beaten there. And uh, let me just see if our computer's telling us any results at the moment. Oh, let's have a look at the photo. That's the way. So Goss. Well, that didn't help very much, did it? Anyway. Uh, the computers are saying nothing because of course it was the sprint for sixth place so we don't know the result but a couple of points definitely involved in that uh, in the advantage of Matty Goss so he'd be pleased if only he can produce that sprint when he gets to the finishing line but he seems to have much more of a problem with Peter Sagan in the finishes back up to the front here because this is Cyril Gauthier of the Europe car team and there is David Miller setting the pace as well the gap is still there and uh, with only we're inside 40 miles to go there's still 11 minutes and 20 seconds it's going to be a tough chase back oh, and it's going to be a pretty exciting one as they start to whip it up to bring that group of five back it will be under every aspect a very tight finish today in Annane we'll see you in a moment new super domestic he hasn't put weight on overnight he's actually got about five or six or even more drinking bottles of water and he's off to look for his sky teammates that's the world champion mark cavendish here he comes distribution point here are boys he'll speak in his best liverpool accent uh, which i can do because i come from that region as well <laughs> and here he is all right lads uh, here's, your, here's your bottles like uh, as soon as you drank them I'm go i'll go back and i'll get you some more you know here we are the race goes on and the break is still 11.36 ride to mapmyride.com slash tdf there's a chance there to win over fifty-five thousand dollars in prizes the peloton here is trailing now by 12 and three quarter minutes albeit and they're not going to see the riders now who've just entered the last 30 miles of the race we're looking at the world champion mark cavendish he's been behind the race but not through fatigue and he's gently coming back behind his team car he has to be a bit careful with this as he paces back up to the peloton but he wasn't back because of a mechanical or a fall he's uh, been back because he needed to go behind those uh, maize plants on the right so the world champion a uh, quiet day for he didn't contest the sprint and i don't think he will today if they don't catch up with those five leaders uh, but on the other hand if uh, if they do catch up with those five leaders which i think is impossible now uh, then he would i think go for the win this is one stage you wouldn't have expected to have seen a bunch sprint i'm sure the organizers didn't because the approach is a little bit tricky for the big peloton today Cavendish moving neatly through the time of day oh, that clock is exactly right 25 to 4 in the afternoon the Prieur de Mont well it uh, looks a little bit like the, the church a bit further up the road there the Prieur de Mont was from a priory formerly founded in the 11th century by the Benedictine monks and uh, in fact it was uh, cleared to be in this region and at one time they actually bred silkworms in this monastery to in this priory to uh, to produce an income for the monks takes an awful lot of silkworms by the way to make a silk duvet and uh, do you know what Paul you get the piece of silk which is the, as big as a penny and they stretch that out to be feet square it is amazing I've seen them do it but only in South Africa actually not in uh, not in France very similar to gold a very malleable uh, metal the Benedictine order by the way was founded back in 529 by Saint Benedict of Nursia Eisel tucking away nicely, uh, just uh, tapping out the rhythm. He was off the back uh, earlier today on the mountains, helping Mark Cavendish recover. Now he's gone to the front to do his job for the team. Christian Canis, where does that man find his energy from? He's the other workhorse through the centre of the day. Meanwhile, uh, beneath blue skies and fluffy clouds, this is the breakaway. 12.37, they're still doing incredibly well. 
they've been in the saddle now for four and a half hours and uh, they're going to be in the saddle for probably another 45 minutes it's difficult to explain for when you get into a situation like this a five-man breakaway you have 45 kilometers to go you know you're going to win you've got to try and figure out how do you win because these guys that we're looking at they're not prolific winners as we uh, get a chance to see the excitement at the front end and the back end of the main field but you know Martinez Egoi Martinez has not won a race since 2006 and that was a stage of the Vuelta a España they're just three minutes ahead of the slowest expected arrival time today which was still an average speed of 38 kilometers an hour they should hold on to that today which means they having left town 11 o'clock this morning they're going to finish around five o'clock that is a long time in the saddle well i'm just wondering phil just looking down at the facts and the factoids uh, when you look at the stage victories martinez as i said hasn't won a race since 2006 which was a stage of the vuelta a España. the other three riders in the breakaway kizilovsky cyril gautier and uh, pero haven't won a race since 2010 the most recent winner is david miller who won a stage of the giro d'italia last year mm -hmm. and it was the final stage Forty-five kilometers left to ride now, and it's uh, the polka dot jersey is appreciated here. Thirty years of celebration it began in '82. So quite clearly, the crowd here know when they, they they didn't invent the king of the mountains back in '82. That's when they decided to give a recognisable jersey to the leader of the king of the mountains. few years earlier with the King of the Mountains, 1982, Robert Miller actually won the, the only British rider ever to win the King of the Mountains, Robert Miller back in 1984. Now we've got David Miller right here, no relation by the way, in the breakaway, except they both come from Scotland, and that's Miller on the far side, while we look here into the eyes of Igoi Martinez from Spain. We're looking here at the peloton, uh, one man who really took the race to Bradley Wiggins yesterday was Vincenzo Nibali. So let's see whose value is rising, brought to you by Scott Trade. It is of course Vincenzo Nibali. He really rode a terrific race yesterday. He promised he would attack. He's been saying bad things about uh, Bradley Wiggins in the press, saying that he's not nice the way he stirs at him in the bunch. And so he broke away from him. And uh, he gave him a rough time, but at the end, Wiggins, I think this was the making up of the friendship as they cross the line in La Toussier. So that was uh, our value is rising brought to you by Scott Trade. I think we'll see a lot from Vincenzo Nibali when we go into the Pyrenees as well. Sleeping on the job now. We'll accuse Bernard Eisler of that as he lies down on his bike, but he's straightened up again as the peloton continue. So we just to remind us where we've been. We'll have a quick look at the Geico stage map. This, remember, is the longest tour stage of this year's Tour de France. It all began today. We're right down now. We're heading to the Mediterranean at the bottom of the map, but that's tomorrow. Uh, today on the 13th of July, the eve of France's Bastille Day celebrations. We left the mountains behind us uh, via two cols, the Col de Grand Couchon, and then we nipped over the next one, the Col de Granier. There it is, and then it was uh, down to the valleys. And once they'd had the little battles there, the breakaway established on the descent of Granier. That's the one we should worry about, the Côte d'Ardois, because uh, that is a little springboard for one of these five riders now to try and strike home for gold. You top out 11 miles from the finish. Mark Cavendish coming up through the cars. Uh, cool, it's riding up towards the end we'll see if he practices his sprint he'll only he's only going to be sprinting though for sixth place today but nonetheless he may want to practice his legs for tomorrow's sprint much more suited to him down in Cafodag. it's been a good day off after the big battle in the alps yesterday for bradley wiggins he won't be complaining about that believe me and there's chris Froome on his back wheel the world champion mark cavendish uh, doing his work with the sky team quite regularly here 12 minutes 20 seconds do you think Cavan Cav will go for sixth place Paul just to test his sprint for tomorrow perhaps I don't think so Phil with that climb towards the end it's uh, six kilometers long I think what he's going to do is uh, get himself focused on tomorrow's stage victory he's had a lot of uh, hard time through the mountains I think he will not try and push himself too much over this final climb and once he's got himself to a position where he's not going to get eliminated I think he'll sit up with some of the other sprinters although I wouldn't be surprised to see uh, a guy like uh, Andre Greipel 
having to go trying to get over now this is not the hunchback of Notre Dame no in fact it is uh, Daniel Martin here who has tried to make a move yesterday didn't got a bit tired towards the end um, now it's not a huge wind blowing here by the way it's not the Mistral or the Tram Montana it is in fact the helicopter waving around those maize, maize fields there well somebody's invested in their car there because uh, straight <laughs> it'd be, be decaled all over that car we go and that's obviously for Bradley Wiggins that's his nickname and that's the name that he wears down the side of his jersey when he wears his normal racing jersey we go and the uh, Wigo the O is made into a Royal Air Force spot yes yeah, a decal of a, of a jet anyway there we have we go in the fourth man in line the car was also sprayed yellow money was no expense there was it for the supporter Well, we are on the longest stage of the race today, a massive distance of 140 miles. Uh, if any of you are just tuning in, we can give you a quick run around of what has happened today. It is stage 12, Saint-Jean-de-Maurienne is where we started. Two first category climbs, this is the top of the Col de Grand Coucheron, uh, which we topped after 22 miles of racing, and it was uh, Kiselowski who was first over there on the descent, I'm sorry to tell you. Uh, David Moncoutier crashed out, he's in hospital at the moment and that was his 11th and last Tour de France and he had finished all tours until today. Then we moved on to the Col de Granier which we topped at 50 miles into the stage today. Same order over the summit, Kizilowski, the breakaway thinned down a little bit and as he went over the top uh, it looked as though they were going to all be swept up by the peloton. Wiggins made a cheeky move, he went up to join a, a little assault group and I think it was just to demonstrate to the leaders of the peloton he was feeling good, so don't bother attacking me today. And then they reorganized the bottom, then we had a sprint. This was the sixth place here, and a massive run for the line by Kenny Van Hummel, chased down by Matthew Goss and Andre Greipel. Sagan got pushed out of it, and so good points in the bank for the green jersey by Matty Goss. He gained two points uh, there in the bank over the line green jersey of Peter Sagan. He was only given four of that group. Meanwhile, as we look over the maize field at the boys, the weather is getting warmer by the minute. We're almost touching 80 degrees now. Light winds, partly cloudy, and there's a big crowd waiting in the finish. We've never been to Annonay before with the Tour de France. And in the distance, a little hill. We go over one of those banks getting to the finish. So as we continue through the ripening corn, we are heading towards the one little climb at the end which might prove to be the climb that decides the race today. It's a third category climb, it is only a few kilometres, about two and a half miles, but if the man can get 30 seconds over the top pole, he could make it to the line. It's about 18 kilometres to go over the top. Ideally situated for a man who's got a bit of climbing ability, but uh, you know, that could be Jean-Christophe Perrault who finished in ninth place in the Tour de France last year, or Egoi Martinez who himself is a very good climber. They would want to try and slip away from David Miller if they can, because if it came down to a five-man sprint, I think I'd put my money on David Miller. Okay. So the peloton enjoying the uh, sights and sounds of the Tour de France as they continue on towards the finish today and uh, we'll take a break, we'll come back and we'll be a little bit closer to the finish in Anime. Is Steve Perino, so maybe he can show us and tell us a little bit more. Guys, behind me, the final sprint, a quarter mile straight away, slightly uphill, same as the two kilometers preceding that. However, coming in to this final sprint, one of France's favorite safety features, for the drivers anyway, the roundabout. As they lead into this, as you can see, traffic can go either way. Same thing for the cyclists. Now, if the breakaway survives, not much of a danger here. However, if the group reforms and the sprinters are in it, it could be very dangerous. Ironically, before you come into every roundabout in France, it says you do not have priority. Guys, how do you think the sprinters will respond to that? Hey, thanks, Steve. That actual roundabout, uh, I thought it was traffic circle in America, but anyway, we'll stick with roundabout, it's English. Uh, that is 450 yards before the line. That's why I suspect they weren't in planning on a bunch sprint today. At least they've got five riders clear and they may not race as hard for sixth place. 
Well, it looks like the harvest is coming in here as we get down south in France because it's much nicer weather than up north at this time of the year. The peloton, Paul, still 12 minutes back. Yep, they are not going anywhere at all in the main field. They're just quite happy to keep it pegged nice and tightly here, but these guys have got to start thinking about what they're going to do. They'll be now looking for telltale signs on the faces of the other riders in the break. They'll be looking for telltale physical signs, a body language saying this guy's starting to weaken. He's not that strong. I might be able to get away on the slopes of this climb because this climb, as we've said, Phil, the Côte d'Ardois is situated in an ideal position to the finishing line. I make it about uh, 19 kilometers to go from the top of the climb and yeah. once you've gone over the top if you've got a 35 or 45 second advantage you've got a good chance of holding on to the win yeah and as you said earlier it is uphill towards the finish and there is a, a roundabout 450 meters from the finishing line which could be tricky and decisive there's a lamppost in the center of this roundabout with no straw bale on it and half of these ex-mountain bikers will probably go straight across it anyway that's for the future right now we're looking at Alexander Vinokurov he's riding near the back of the peloton as he rides in towards the finish had a very serious accident in the Tour de France last year didn't want to leave the tour with that crash so he came back for one more crack well uh, just before we get down to the town of uh, Anonois where we finish Anonay where we finish here this afternoon uh, before we get there a little history lesson about this town for this is the I'm home ready. of the people who invented the Montgolfier or the hot air balloon they did the first ever unmanned Mon oh, hot air balloon flight from here and in fact the bridge we're about to go over in a little while once we cross over the river not too far away from here the bridge of Andons was built by the grand nephew of the Montgolfier brothers well I hope they show that bridge it is a beautiful bridge it is only two bicycle width so it's very narrow as I said half of the riders I hope they can swim but for the leaders shouldn't be a problem this is the peloton they're still massing they're not really racing but they're going to come on very narrow road soon I think that will automatically increase uh, the pace of the race these are the leaders they're on narrow roads as uh, there's the bridge I was telling you about see how narrow it is the peloton's got to get through that we'll take a break to the right hand side if you want to go straight to the finishing line in Anonay. Yeah. It says Anonay to the right and the riders go left. They circumnavigate the town so they come in the correct way. And the reason they do that is to go and find this nasty little climb. Although the climb that they're going to find I think is a little easier than the climb if they came straight down towards the finish line because that was a tough climb that we came over on our shortcut to the finish line this morning. Yeah it was actually um, but I think it was because of the situation. The Côte d'Ardu, 12-10 uh, is the gap. The leaders are well clear today. We're on the third category climb now, the last chance. Surely somebody will try to go here. There's the marker. They have just done uh, five kilometres of climbing still to go to the summit of this climb. And so far, they've been on it for, what, a kilometre? There's been no change of pattern in the breakaway. They're still going together. Yep, that's four miles of climbing to come up to the top. It's not a big climb in, in itself, but it's in fact, it's ideally situated as a launch pad. Looking a little bit nervous there in the orange jersey, Ego Martinez, well, he should be because he hasn't won a race since 2006 when he won a stage of the Vuelta a España. But at the early part of his career, he, met, in fact, won the Tour de l'Avenir, which is a race called the Race for the Future mm. or the Hopefuls. Yes, and that's, uh, that's a good race for the youngsters coming up, and if you win that, you usually do very well at the top end of professional cycling. I still have been on the front doing all the work for Team Sky for a long time. These bunch, these, this big bunch, happy to course through these narrow roads, but the sprinters will want to win the green jersey points at the end, so they've got to be very careful. Look at this, Mark Cavendish working overtime today as a super domestique. We'll talk about a man who's done a lot of work. They're coming up to the 20 kilometre to go point, and that's the last point where you can take on board drinks. Not only did Mark Cavendish go back to get drinks there, but so too did Michael Rogers. Yep, and that's a sign to me, Paul. He's working so hard carrying the bottles to his team. Uh, he's not going to take part in the sprint today. Now we're back with the leaders sooner or later, and I hope it's not when our camera is showing the peloton. There will be an attack from this group. They're all getting twitchy. You see, you, you can be absolutely certain that the man in the red, white, and blue jersey there, uh, David Miller, is uh, looking at these other riders. He's the most seasoned professional rider in this group, and look at the little gear he's got. He's got that strange elliptical uh, chain ring on there. The idea of that is it's supposed to make it a little bit easier when your pedals are at uh, 90 degrees to the ground as you go over what they call top dead center. A bit of action on the Rhone River here as they pass under that uh, suspension bridge we've seen. 
Well, I have a couple of mates who live in the middle of uh, Lake Victoria, and that's the kind of boat, boat they would need, I reckon, to get over some of the marshland to get themselves access to their islands. Perfect in the Everglades, I think they call them skidoos or something like that, I'm not sure. No doubt you'll all tell me by tomorrow morning. So the peloton, now still a lot of movement down there, but no interest in the wind today. Uh, Cavendish has distributed all of his drinking bottles, enjoying his day as Isles talk to him. A lot of time Mark Cavendish has for Bernard Isle. He says, what do you want to eat? Try this one. Well, he's got a menu, and I think he's actually gone back to do the a la carte for this Team uh, Sky <laughs> at the moment. But tomorrow, Phil, will be a different situation. Totally. I think they will. he will turn around and ask them to give him a lead-out on the running towards the finish. He is, of course, let's not forget, the fastest man in the world, and over the last five years of his participations at the Tour de France, he's amassed 21 individual stage victories. That's right, and when we say fastest man in the world, we mean road racing, of course. They sprint a lot faster. This is for Gordon Singleton, the former world sprint champion who lives in Canada, did write and say, look, the fastest man in the world is on the track, and you're right, Sir Chris Hoy, world record holder, Marty Notstein, they were all great men who could get well inside 10 seconds over 200 metres, but they'd have a job to do that over 200 metres on the road, with every respect, of course. 22 kilometers to go 2.3 miles or to the end of the of the top of the climb it's uh, I'm surprised but maybe the hill isn't feeling just steep enough to kick there are more little climbs which aren't marked just before the finish well it rumbles over the top on a plateau with uh, an undulating ride for about 10 kilometers or so before they reach the small town of uh, Cantenas and that's when they drop down into the outskirts of Anone but they will all be waiting and looking for that opportunity but you know you can notice at the front end of the main field the red and black jerseys that is Cadell Evans teams and he will always be looking for that opportunity on the far side on the other side of the sky ride as you can see Lotto Belisol they are looking after their man Jürgen Vandenbroek inside 22 kilometers to go at the moment and just a reminder that today's commercial free stage is brought to you by Nissan and the 2003 Nissan Altima and the peloton speeding past here as they advertise all the products of the region people love the passage of the Tour de France don't they here still those five riders and we haven't missed anything a wave to everybody down below us as we move back to the breakaway on the Tour de France today we'll move back to the peloton here Paul and uh, they're just anxious to get to the finish uh, the sprinters will come up in the last couple of kilometres to see what they can do and they better be aware of all these roundabouts on the way through as well inside 12 minutes now I think be, the shadow boxing must begin up front soon yeah it certainly will have to but uh, you can see the main contenders are taking this run in very seriously even though they're 12 minutes behind they're not thinking about the stage victory but they are still thinking of trying to get a few seconds here and there on Bradley Wiggins in the overall standings and watch out because Jürgen Vandenbroek and Cadell Evans yes they've tried to take time back in the mountains but they've always launched very vicious attacks on the flat run-ins towards these finishes well safety is also the number here and it looks as though we've got the lotto squad moving up and that'll be for Andre Greipel and maybe also for Jürgen Vandenbroek they want to keep the riders safe here nothing uh, remember that terrible crash we had the other in the opening week of the tour and the last three kilometers we've had some horrendous crashes 22 riders going out with broken bones over the first uh, 10 days of the tour well distance to the top of the climb in miles is about one and a half it doesn't seem to have been steep enough to prompt the riders to try and it may be being a, it's still a sort of 18 kilometers over the top to the finish which is around 11 miles it may be seen as being just that little bit too far There's the big flag, and the man is in the breakaway there, David Miller, the flag of uh, the United Kingdom, and nobody is attacked yet. Well, it could be a clean sweep for Kizilowski, the rider on the front. He won the first two climbs with a Couchon and a Granier. This is only worth two points, but why not make it a, a, a nap hand today? Well, that's what he'll be looking for. Don't forget, it's his own teammate, Frederick Kesiakov, who leads the King of the Mountains classification. I have a feeling, Phil, this may well go right the way down to a five-man sprint at the end, probably because most of these guys have got very, very tired bodies, and they don't have the confidence to go out and look at a 10- or 12-mile solo breakaway.
for Uscatel. They really could do with a result here for Martinez. They've had an unfortunate tour to say the least. They've lost four riders, including their Olympic champion Sanchez and uh, Arnett Chiruka, who's a very strong climber, before we even get into their home territory of the Pyrenees. Here we come, uh, heading over the line. No contest. Kizilowski has taken the points for his team. Won all three climbs today, Kizilowski. Now, as we top that, it means we are 11 miles or 18 kilometers from the finish. Sooner or later, they've got to hit each other. And if they don't, it'll go down to the sprinter. None of these riders are renowned as great sprinters. In fact, only uh, six victories for four of those riders. 37 for David Miller on his own. It's all down to Miller's opportunism now, I think. Edouard Boysenhagen, the Norwegian champion, on the front again for Sky. And meanwhile at the back, Bernard Eisel is just getting on to the peloton. Well, it's been, uh, if you like, almost a day off for the riders from Team Sky this afternoon. They had to put a little bit of pressure on in the early part of this race when we went over the first big climbs of the day. But now they're just making sure that they can drag the peloton to the finish. And they will just try and regroup and think about what they can do when we go down to the Pyrenees. All of the big high spots now of today's stage have been left behind us now. It's all eyes in for the finish. And who's going to get the advantage or the opportunity to add their name to the long list of stage winners at the Tour de France? Well, they've cruised up to the heights and now they pretty much stay up here for the rest of the race. There's undulations with a little climb uh, up to the finishing line. They've got a matter of about nine roundabouts to negotiate. Eisel here is back left, so he's getting onto the back of the peloton. Over five and a quarter hours in the saddle on this longest stage of the Tour de France. Two first category mountains at the beginning, and then the race has been more or less neutralized as far as the race for yellow goes by the Sky Team. It is the survivors of a breakaway which originally was 19, apart with the exception of the ride in orange, uh, Igor Martinez. He caught them up uh, on the climb of the Granier, but for the others, they've been in the lead since the ninth mile of the day, or the 15th kilometre of the longest stage of the race. So when they get to the finish, the, the basic core of this breakaway will have done 211 kilometres out in front today. It's a long way, Paul. Well, put it into perspective, that's 130 miles, if you like, in, uh, in old money. Now, that makes me tired when you say it like that. So, as the peloton are now on this last climb of the day, there's been no attack from the front five, there's been no attack from the peloton. We don't really expect it uh, from the peloton here as they now course towards the finish. Uh, but sooner or later, those first five riders up front, and they're still a long way up front, are not going to want to go down to the finish together. We are now 15 kilometers from the finish, while the peloton are around about 20. Yeah, you might have just noticed on the top of that outcropping, Phil, there, that was there, it is there over on the left-hand side, that is the Oriole Tower. That's all that remains of a medieval castle that was here, which commanded a view over the eye gorges. However, it was destroyed during the Hundred Years' War, and for it was ravaged by companies of mercenaries who were recruited during the war. The castle then became the den of Erard, the criminal of Vernou. Well, he stole the rest of the bricks then, that can be the only answer to that. As we look at Edvard Boysenhagen on the front now, just tapping out the rhythm. That's his job, and that's been his job all day, and he's done it well. Remember in the Tour de France, if Wiggins does win this Tour de France, he won't be taking any of the big prize money. It goes into the pot and will be shared out amongst his team. Uh, that's the tradition of the Tour de France. The speed these guys are going up this climb, Phil, makes me realise that Matty Goss is going to survive on this climb here this afternoon, so there will have to be a very big, important sprint just yep. for sixth place between Matty Goss and Peter Sagan, the rider from Slovakia, the Slovakian national champion, actually. And again, once again, like I said, fireworks coming here early to the Tour de France this afternoon. These five riders are still holding on to a big chunk of their advantage, 11 minutes and 20 seconds. At the lead, yeah. Well, it's his Bastille Day tomorrow here in France. There'll be huge celebrations. and may even start tonight with the fireworks or tomorrow. 
a gap 11 16 now for these leaders then the massive crowd has turned out this is a rare visit to this part of the Ardèche for the tour well although tomorrow is the big celebration day for the French uh, Le 14 juillet Bastille day it's usually the night before that they have the massive big firework displays one of the biggest and the best is actually not too far away from where we'll be dri driving tonight around the old medieval city of Carcassonne it, I'm gonna watch it on the telly it's so magnificent I don't think I think you'd be sat in the car on that highway judging by all the holiday traffic going south today the Lardeshois uh, are the people who live here in the Ardèche stunning area of France every little department has its own unique character for sure 11 minutes 14 seconds is the gap 20 kilometers to go well we're well through 15 so we're some six and a half to seven kilometers behind the five leaders today but all the men who are leading on time in the Tour de France are locked together well we're really now really heading very much into the heart of the area of the Montgolfier brothers was actually right here in Annonay that the first official flight of a hot air balloon took place it was actually unmanned and it was at always designed by the Montgolfier brothers the peloton enjoy the spectacle climbing here this is the last official climb of the day there is the climb gentle climb up to the finish the other day you may remember when uh, Tommy Buckler was winning there they were it was up uh, the headline was the last dead man standing was the winner because they gave it all on that climb reminds me five riders going to the line it could be the same situation today yeah but I'm not quite Watch out on the left there now because Leafy Gus is starting to plan the sprint for Peter Sagan. Let me remind you that today's commercial free stage brought to you by Nissan and the 2013 Nissan Altima. And this is uh, the commercial free right up to the finishing line today. Now the sprinters are beginning to shuffle the pack at the front. So as they go over the top of the summit, about 10.50-55 was the gap over the line uh, at the peloton. They'll just think about sprinting them for sixth place. But when are they going to have a go at each other? Because they will not go to the line in a group of five for the win today. Well, they will uh, be trying to figure out how to outwit and how fox the other riders. Uh, as you can see, though, Phil, they are picking up uh, quite a strong tailwind. And that will make it even more difficult to actually get away from this lead group because you'll always feel as if you've got that bit of assistance with the wind pushing on your tail. Cantina is the name of this small town that we're going through now here. And this, of course, the people who live here are known as Cantasassin. Right. No relation to Eric Cantona, I suppose. He used to play for Manchester United. As the five riders go around one of the many roundabouts into the finish now, which might be more of a problem for the peloton than these five leaders. They're absolutely riding quite regularly to the line. Everybody doing their shirt at the front, dropping back, taking a brief respite. Martinez has just gone through. We're looking there at Cyril Gauthier. It's tough to be in a situation like this because you know you're on the eve of something very, very big. If you can win a stage in the Tour de France, it will set you up for the rest of your career. And that's what this young kid is thinking about here, 24 years of age, Cyril Gauthier. He's the rider in the green jersey of Team Europe car. This man, though, started cycling on the road at a very, very late age because he only started riding on the road in 2010, and that's Jean-Christophe Perrault, ninth overall in the Tour de France last year, but a silver medal in the mountain bike in Beijing. So can he make it three stage wins for Eurocar? It'd be incredible to think that the French have had three stage wins so far. The other one was uh, Thibaut Pino and so they're having a great tour as a country as well and let me remind you that today's commercial free stage brought to you by Nissan a proud partner of Radio Shack Nissan Trek Ten seventeen. it came back almost a second just then as they are now going down this little bit of a descent uh, according to our map there is a small descent and then it's basically all uphill to the line as we go towards the five kilometers to go sign well they're dropping down into the center of the city of Anone it's the most populated town in the whole of the area of the Ardèche but then they will start to climb up for the last uh, three and a half kilometers and that's when it starts to get tricky for lots of twists and turns lots of traffic furniture on the road just like this one here 
Yes, there's only 17,500 people live in Alanae. We go in, get a look at it, but it's too narrow to finish the race in, so we climb away from it uh, to finish today's stage in the Tour de France. And sooner or later, and I think it's when the climb starts, oh, it always worries me, those uh, traffic islands. They made a right turn through the slalom, says they go right around in a complete semicircle. And now, surely, Paul, they've got to hit each other. Well, Perrault has seen that he's got a little gap there. He was the rider in the white jersey, looked over his shoulder, saw the gap, insisted a bit, but then he noticed that he was being pulled back into the main field. Miller is very attentive. He takes up first position now. He's probably thinking that he's got the jump on these guys if it comes down to the sprint. We haven't yet got down to the bottom of this descent. I think it's somewhere once we start to climb up towards the finish line, we'll start to see the first person take a little dig to try and get himself a little taste of glory. Just look at Sir Gauthier here, just doing a little flick left to right to get ready. He may be planning a move as Kizzy. Well, this is the man I thought would make the first move, the Croat. Kesiakov has just gone to the front, false alarm. Bear in mind, the last team to win the last two days is Team Europe Car. Now, they won with Thomas Vogel two days ago. They won yesterday with Pierre Roland, and they've got... Now, there's the move by Egoi Martinez on the slope, and they haven't responded. Miller has. Uh, that was a little false one. He just checked to see where they were, Martinez, and now he's seen that Miller very, very attentive. Miller's chased him down. Watch out for Kivilowski. He's closed the gap. Five together again. Miller's swung off. Checking now. This is where the cat and mouse starts, and that's the time for... No, it isn't the time for Igor Martinez. You're right, Phil. Cyril Gauthier looks like a man who could be a very good sprinter. He doesn't have very many references. Only won two victories in his career. The last one, the Tour of Adelie back in 2010, but he's zigzagging about at the back end of the line and he obviously is a man who's got a bit of an explosive punch and he's waiting to see which line he's going to follow. Look at him there. If he wins this, it'll be the third win in a row for Europe Car and yeah. for France. It would be incredible result. Uh, the fourth win for France but the third, yes, from Europe Car. You're absolutely right. We'll see as they now ease back on the climb. A little rise is top tier. They are waiting for someone to make a move. As we gaze down from the helicopter, time is running out. Three and a half kilometers to go, and there is the next attack. It's coming from the Croatian rider, Kisilovski, who's launched immediately. It's the mountain biker, Pero after him, and then Miller. Well, Kisilovski hasn't won a race either, Phil, since 2010. They're all very nervous now. They know that there's only about two miles to go to the finish, three and a half kilometers. I still think that Gauthier is looking very, very dangerous. They're going to have to do something to try and dislodge him because he looks like a real puncher when it comes down to the finish. Miller, though, I have to say, at 35 years of age, in first position, is being very, very attentive to all of these little flurries of attacks. And maybe that's a sign of great confidence. After 211 kilometers in the lead, any one of these deserves the victory, but sadly, it can only go to one, and it's a stage of the Tour de France. They'll dine out on a victory in Annonay forever for the man who gets it. And that's the important thing to remember. You don't get this situation. Happens very often. Normally, when a breakaway goes clear in the Tour de France, I would say 99 times out of 100 it gets caught. Today is the success. Miller is in first position. He's been here before. This is almost like the run into Bezier when he won way back in 2002. At th three kilometers to go, we've slowed down because they've no worry about the whereabouts of the peloton. They're now at nine minutes and 52 seconds. Miller has launched a tester because Kizilofti has launched an attack and he's down to David Miller to close it down. The others are chasing, but it looks to me as though Gauthier is caught a little bit at the back. Well, Miller straight onto the wheel of Kizilofsky in the turquoise jersey of Timo Stana. Perro is right onto the back wheel. Soto is Egoi Martinez. The little rider from Urumqar slightly tailed off the back there, but he's pulling himself back. Perro now, the mountain biker, goes over the top in the white jersey. And one of the many roundabouts lined out by the crowd there. You couldn't even see it. And now it is uh, Jean-Christophe Perro has launched the attack. Miller is trying to reach him because the others are struggling. It doesn't look like it, but this is quite a hard climb. Egoi Martinez was a little over geared for me there and he's let the gap go and now it's going to be up to Kizilovsky to try and respond. Miller has almost got his back well, wheel onto Perro. As we're 
they're looking with two kilometers to go they might have snapped the elastic there and Miller has got across the sprinter Gauthier has seen the danger he's had to launch an attack and Martinez is willing to go with him but it's hard to nail it back though once you've let the move go at the end of a race like this Phil at two and a half kilometers to go if you let the gap go you're not on the wheel it's very difficult to nail it back the two riders Perro and Miller have now got themselves a 50 meter advantage over the three chasers and, and Miller now is setting the pace and we climb all the way to the line now David Miller's gonna have to make another decision here. he doesn't want to stay on the front he'll see the two kilometer banner just around this corner the others will continue to come and Miller's gonna have to somehow coax Jean-Christophe Perrault in front of him and he's got to do it in the next kilometre but he won't do it for the moment Phil because he wants to consolidate on the difference between himself and these riders behind because it's still only 50 metres those two leaders cannot play cat and mouse just yet they've got to get into the finishing straight into the last 500 metres with a good advantage before they try and figure out who's going to take the first position who's going to take second in the sprint for the line well at two kilometres to go it is a two-man race Kizikoski's legs have cracked after he's won all three mountain climbs today Miller though does not want to lead out Jean-Christophe Perrault to the line the three chasers can see the quarry but I'm not sure they can get across now this is uphill well uh, that was Martinez giving a sign there to Gauthier if you want to win the stage young man from France here this afternoon you're going to have to collaborate with me because to win we have to catch these two David Miller in first position looks cool his pedaling action is nice and smooth <laughs> Perrault beautiful. comes up alongside him he's sitting there with the cadence if he was uh, just uh, pacemaking the peloton and look at that he's cruised the mountain biker into the front of him now and don't worry about the race behind there'll be about another 12 minutes before they finish it's about which one of these two wins the Tour de France stage today they are concerned though Phil about the three riders just behind them because if they allow them to come back now these guys have left too much energy on the road if they get caught by the three chasers then they may well lose their chance of victory Miller again psychologically forcing the well he's not a young rider because Perro <laughs> only came to the sport after a long career as a mountain biker he rode a magnificent first tour last year broke into the top nine finishes of the tour there up the road is the last thousand meters of the longest day in the Tour de France which was 23,000 meters and now as they come up to the walls the finish now are these three going to be desperate Kizilowski looks as though he's going to try again well this is when you've got to be a hard man this is when you've got to get the poker face on you've got to play that game of poker properly and David Miller of anybody in that breakaway should be able to do that you've Clever. got to make sure that the other guy panics he's looking at the chance of winning a first Tour de France stage for Perro so force him to make the mistake and use his back wheel to your advantage for the moment though Miller's happy to sit in first place it's the tempting moment now the cards are on the table who's got the full house as Miller makes the right bend he's remember we do have this roundabout in the last 400 meters there's the sign on the right of it which they're shown to the riders of course Miller has got to keep the tempo the way he's riding he is confident that when this man jumps behind him he can handle him David Miller looking for a fourth stage win in the Tour de France staring out at Jean-Christophe Perrault who will wait and wait and wait the reason being he I don't think he's a very very good sprinter well he's not got any pedigree from sprinting but this is now one man against another it's two two riders looking you can see Ego Martin is trying to catch 200 meters to go this is going to be a short sprint now Perro there starts he goes. there he goes now Miller has got to wind that gear for the moment it's advantage Perro but now Miller is turning the gear David Miller is uh, going to the line and he gets it for Great Britain remember he's going to go to the Olympics but this time it's for the American Garmin team David Miller gets his fourth historical stage win of the Tour de France he did that with such panache and remember it was Miller's attack on the way down the Col de Granier that started the break that won the day and for the Scot it was his victory look at his face though that is a face of joy the next riders over the Rhine though were Martinez, Gauthier and Kizilowski Miller has pushed himself Phil he's really got into the, the oxygen debt the proudest moment for uh, Garmin at the moment they've been knocked around this year by the crashes they've lost their two leaders uh, to try and win the Tour de France David Miller today in a breakaway a massive long breakaway on the longest day finally does it for Garmin Sharp
to make that feel the 38th victory of Miller's career but most of his victories have been individual time trials that's his speciality but here he rode that to perfection he was in the right place at the right time but he saw the move coming from Perro and look at this Perro jumped at 200 meters to go Miller starts to get the acceleration up he was in the right gear Miller he starts to roll it at this point he knows he's got it and he starts to kick and Perro looks backwards know that he's been beaten but he still wants to see whether he can stay with the Scott on the line that's a great victory and it reminds me very much Phil of the way that he won that stage that road stage of the Tour de France back in Bézier in 2010 yep. 10 years ago so Pedro Martinez Gauthier is the result and let's not forget the peloton we are going to be treated to an equally exciting sprint finish from the peloton pool because they're racing for the green jersey points they have to take on board here it's got to be Greipel involved it's got to be Sagan and of course it has got to be uh, Matthew Goss they're racing for 15 points for sixth place yeah I can see the green jersey of Peter Sagan fill in about 10th or 12th position he's got a teammate up alongside him that will probably be Daniel Oss because he's normally the guy who leads out Peter Sagan but he is sitting on the wheel there of Matthew Goss you can see just to the right hand side of that group of riders there there's a lot of riders from Orica Green Edge getting themselves organized well let's remind ourselves it is an uphill finish if any of the leaders got just a single bike length ahead they would get a one second advantage and it would be annoying if it wasn't going to help change positions in the overall for that reason perhaps Michael Rogers pushes on the speed here uh, all in the aid of Bradley Wiggins around that short right hander it's over six and a half minutes since David Miller won the stage well now as Michael Rogers just doing those last few moments he's not concerned about getting a place in the top 10 on an individual stage like this what he's concerned is about getting his man Bradley Wiggins in the yellow jersey to the finish line safely they're inside of the final kilometer in the main field now and moving right up there is uh, Daniel Oss is in fact on the wheel of Cadell Evans a little bit further back you've got the green jersey of Peter Sagan yes yeah, Sagan's dropped back we're at 800 meters this is a very slow start but on the left of our picture the second rider with the beard is Matthew Goss he had a little bit of a contretemps with the feet of the barriers there and he's going to come round enough to come off those barriers as he now tries to break through Goss is in second wheel here Sagan has come right up to him as they start to dash around the roundabout the sprinters have gone to the right it's coming back together again they are 400 meters from the line and now Wiggins is still trying to mix in with this one as Matthew Goss starts to go he's got a good position Sagan is third Goss is second now is Sagan going to get the better because this is a slightly uphill sprint now Matthew Goss goes and takes the green jersey towards Paris if he gets any more points but watch the finish now a little bit of movement there by Matthew Goss the referees mightn't like that he's complaining and he might have a case well that was a little bit of argy bargy coming into that sprint I think that was a little bit of uh, a tactical maneuver there that to me Phil was a, a naughty little move there against uh, the man yeah. from Slovakia as much as uh, Matty Goss is a good sprinter I think that was done on purpose well that was a whole and uh, the referees don't like people who move off the lines and I don't think it's Peter Sagan it's bad I can't speak his language he didn't like it either well if the referee the penalty would be they would send uh, Matthew Goss to the back of the group he is with and he'd get no points that's well, a bad would be a bad call well, let's there. have a look at it once more Matthew Goss starts here normally when you start the sprint you're supposed to keep to your line now Matthew Goss definitely moves off his line there only by a meter or so but it was quite a violent move mm. I'm not sure what the referees will think about that but I know Peter to Sagan was not too happy because he felt that a meter move to the left hand side like that put him off his sprint and it looked as though he might have been gathering speed the referee will look would he have won if it hadn't happened and he might have done and we're all fighting over a single point there, we are fighting over only a few Hello. points look at these extra spectators we've got <laughs> well there we are that's um that's probably the jury that will decide on the situation between uh, Matthew Goss and Peter Sagan. Nine minutes be a little while before you find out the result of that, but I would think that uh, for the moment uh, Goss beats Sagan. It's the provisional result as it always is. Good sprint by Sebastian Eno for eighth. Cadell Evans got right in amongst it, finishing in ninth place. Miller is the man who's won the stage against Jean-Christophe Perrault. Further down, for the moment at least, their sixth place is Matthew Goss. Seventh is Peter Sagan. Eighth, the sprinter on AG2R, Sebastian Eno. And the top ten completed by Katusha's Luca Paulini. Perfectly.
you've won stages on the tour of course but prologues and time trials this this is a different kind of race and it must mean in, in many ways more well i won stage 13 which was a road stage to bezier in 2002 which is probably my proudest win of the tour and today was very similar the manner in which i did it uh, there's nothing quite like the sensation of winning a road stage it's much more emotional than winning a time trial or a prologue uh, it's a, i really enjoy it in the last few years david you've been very close to pulling off a, a, a coup like this uh, did you think your time had passed no i never thought my time has passed i think it's uh, it's taken a our team going through turmoil to bring out the best in me and uh, we needed it and I wanted to do it so along with Mark Cavendish Chris Froome Bradley Wiggins you're the fourth British stage winner on this tour it. it's our Olympic teams basically made up of Tour de France stage winners uh, I think we're going to be a force to be reckoned with I mean, you've had a long career on the tour David did you ever think that Great Britain would produce a tour like this no I never thought it I never even thought Sky would get to this level so it's an amazing achievement and uh, my hat doff my cap to them played a big part in it today well done Dave. Yeah. Well, a lot of public on the roads today, as you'll see right throughout. This is the first big holiday of the summer in France. It's also Bastille Day. Look at the crowds here, Paul. This is the feeding station and the peloton just passing through. Yeah, well, not surprising, Phil, in the early morning breakaway today, as we like to call it, eight riders getting clear, the majority of them from France, because, of course, this is France's great big holiday, Bastille Day, le 14 juillet. So we'll just see today uh, whether those five Frenchmen can stay away to the end today. There are in fact eight riders in the lead. There they all are, Maxime Bouet, uh, Michael Markov. Michael Markov, so far this Tour de France, has just passed through the 700 kilometer point in a leading group. It's far and away the most by any rider in the race. There's the full list of names for you. But if you have any doubt about whether or not, Phil, this is going to be a bunch sprint at the end of the day, the doubts will be answered by the fact that uh, Orica Green Edge, the Australian team of Matty Goss, have done most of the pacemaking thus far. Well, we're heading first of all to the uh, Green Edge on the map there. That is the sprint point today. Uh, yes, Matty Goss, I think he's coming round to our way of thinking. He was guilty of the offence yesterday, but it wasn't deliberate, and I think that's all that matters. Uh, but he's feeling a little bit disturbed. I think he'll go head to head uh, again with the Green Jersey. But for the moment, we've got this breakaway on. Uh, they are chasing them down, Paul, but they've started to go out a little bit now to five minutes twenty. Well, they pull them back from a maximum of nine minutes and five seconds at one time, back down to four minutes. Then all of a sudden, I think they're relaxing during the middle part of the race here as they go through the feeding station. That's why the gap has gone up a fraction. But they will chase it down. But what a finish we are in store for, Phil. That climb, about twenty kilometres to go, the Mont Saint Clair is a beast of a climb. But the wind on the run into the finish is going to be very, very difficult. Well, the Orica Green Edge team of Matty Goss riding under the shadow of that crop of Australian flags we've just seen here in the feeding station. Well, this is Michael Morkoff here. The man has been in the breakaway for over 700 kilometres since this race began. Well, this is something that Michael doesn't want to be reminded of. It's been exactly five years now since his father passed away from cancer and he said, I want to win this stage to honour him. Well, you don't need uh, more inspiration than that, Paul, do you? No, certainly not. This is a man, he wears you know, the blue and yellow jersey there, 175, and he's led this race. He's been in breakaways Phil, for more than 700 kilometres, and he's still going out on the attack, which impresses me even more, Phil, by the fact that he is, in fact, going to go to the Olympic Games and race on the track over only four kilometres. That's correct. He won a silver medal four years ago on the track in, uh, in the Olympic Games. Well, of course, there's five French riders in this breakaway, and it's been a long time since a Frenchman won on Bastille Day. So let's go to Craig Hummer now. You can tell us more about it, Craig. Bastille Day means the French fans have turned out in force. The French media was up early, and of course, the French riders are on edge. Only 12 French winners on their national holiday, and of course, someone in their core would like to be lucky, number 13. Now, in the start village earlier today, I saw a number of French riders there throwing down a second cup of cappuccino, getting ready to go right from the gun. On Bastille Day, it's all about getting getting in the break if you are French and then hoping you can stay away for the glorious win. Yes, uh, thank you, Craig. Now let's have a look I and mean, let's go back to 2005, the last time a Frenchman won, Paul. Uh, David Moncoutier in the colours of Cofidis 
makes his move and wins the day in Dean Leban on Bastille Day. After a long, long breakaway, but the same man yesterday, Phil, was not having a great day at the Tour de France. He rode across into a breakaway, then all of a sudden on the descent, he crashed out and was taken to hospital at the end of the stage. That was a da sad say for David Moncoutier because it will be his last appearance at the Tour de France. Until this moment, he'd finished all previous 10 tours. Now he's going to say the 11th was one too far and he won't be out for the win today. How sad and how fully the wheel turns in the sport of cycling. Quite Back funny, the lead is then. So Sorry, cool, yeah. quite funny that because in fact he didn't actually want to ride the Tour de France this year. He actually wanted to concentrate on the Vuelta a España at the end of the season, and the team convinced him to change his mind just before the start of the Tour. So, a bit sad, even more sadness really, because he wasn't really expecting to ride the Tour this year. Well, Sir David Moncoutier, no doubt watching the pictures on French television today. Hopefully from home because he was taken to hospital. Anyway, there's the pack, they're speeding on. Actually, the breakaway's been really ripping the road up today. They're ahead of schedule, they've, they've accomplished 42 kilometres in the two hours of racing we've had, which is over 26 and a half miles an hour. They're running on expected time today, which is more than anybody else's who tried to get to the finish line of the tour today. The roads were totally blocked, and there was a real danger. Many of the uh, television commentators weren't going to make their television transmission times. There are thousands of people on this little uh, inlet of Cap d'Agde on uh, the Mediterranean. Well, we're going through the little town of uh, Merviel les Montpellier. Again, it's a town that was uh, at one time was surrounded by walls, but they uh, were destroyed in a battle in 737. And that is the church of Saint Jean le Baptiste, which goes back to the 12th century, although the clock tower and the bell tower was added in the 19th century. So we couldn't tell the time for a few hundred years. This is now the leader here as we goes off into the distance as we circumnavigate Merviel les Montpellier. So the riders are now definitely got the bit between the teeth. It's 31 seconds uh, to the main chase and over two and a half to the peloton. We'll take a breath. Let's have a look then at the man who's blazing a lone trail now towards the finish at Cap Dag and he's doing a good job so far. He's now pushing on to almost three minutes ahead of the peloton and his chasers behind are not keeping up with him. He's got every reason to push hard today as well. Morkov there, average speed today, a massive 47.3 kilometres an hour over the last nine miles. So he's looking at just on 30 miles an hour, this man racing with a tailwind. Yes, he's pushing out some power too, 343 watts. And look at that crowd to cheer him on here today. As he crosses now, he promised us he wanted to win the stage today because of the loss of his father five years ago through cancer, who was his best supporter. Well, we're looking around the island here, which sits just off the mainland, and uh, this is the Cathedral of Saint-Pierre and Saint-Paul de Margolon. It is the solitary cathedral, which is an old volcanic island, and it's linked to the mainland by beach ridges, and it's a marvel of Romanesque art. This man is a marvel of a professional cyclist from Denmark. This is the leader, Michael Morkoff, in the saddle for four hours, 22 minutes, and looking for the last 15 miles of racing today. He is still in the lead. The flotilla of motorcycles now been pushed forward of that breakaway of seven which Morkoff has left and as the camera pulls back there is the main part of the peloton as they hunt down this man as the race nears the climb before the finish well he's trying his heart out now Michael Morkoff for one minute 16 is the spread the peloton are creeping up slowly but surely uh, behind the seven men Morkoff had to leave them behind they weren't quick enough he's pushed on he's gambled and very shortly he's gonna see 25 kilometers to go well I wonder if with the confusion of the main field catching the seven man leading group there'll be a little bit of a slowing down which could go to the advantage of the lone leader here but the thing is Phil this climb Mont Saint Clair is going to hit him like a newspaper in the face a rolled up newspaper that is well, let's hope so anyway approaching the third category climb of Mont Saint uh, Clair it is uh, Saint Clair it is a minute 12 the gap will soon be on the 25 kilometers to go Banner takes some food out he receives the applause from the crowd here but the question is can he hold him off now 
Just look at the crowd here now as we course through set. We're heading towards the finish of the Tour de France. We have to cross this climb. It doesn't look like a climb from the helicopter. And then they'll drop down. There's oh, been a crash as well. There's been a crash in the main field. Orica Green Edge has a rider down. That is Brett Lancaster who wasn't far off the front of the group. Well, the uh, crash happened in front of him. He put his brakes on so hard he went over the top of his machine. Now, those guys from Orica Green Edge, obviously a little tired feel they've been doing a lot of pacemaking at the back end of the uh, front end of the main field. The leader of the King of the Mountains competition went down as well, Frederick Kesiakov. He's well. number 187 and just when he was having a chance to get into the last climb of the only climb of the day this has happened as we cross a, the base here of the town but now there's a real tangle left behind of course they're, they're losing time they're not anywhere near the finish they've got to get on and race and try and get back well uh, another rider going down there from uh, Francais de Jure quite hard that looked like Anthony Roux was sitting on the ground for a while this is why the leaders Phil of the race uh, Bradley Wiggins, Cadell Evans, uh, Vincenzo Nibali all want to sit near the front end of this pack they know this is going to be a very very nervous run in towards the finish line and dangerous too we're in set the center of set now where well, we are 25 kilometers away the peloton has been disrupted by a, a crash there everybody seems to be getting back on the bikes and getting away but the peloton now as we go through this delightful fishing town we are now dodging through narrow streets danger is around every corner Michael Markov now starts the climb 1.6 kilometers to the top this is a really difficult climb but it's only the third category a nasty little beast I would think Sean Yates the team manager of Sky would say because uh, he knows exactly what he wants to happen here he wants his men to get over the top in an ideal position I saw Mark Cavendish riding to the back end of the main field and I wonder if he's in the wrong position to try and survive and stay in contact for the sprinters day to day well uh, Ardica Greenedge lost two riders in that crash uh, Simon Gerrans also involved uh, on his bike though and so too Brett Lancaster they're strong men uh, to help Matthew Goss in the sprint but that is yet to come because that the riders here that Morkov left are also on the climb now but the peloton is closing in there's only 10 seconds between this uh, seven man group who are chasing Michael Morkov and the main field and once they start this climb in honest and on, on honesty in earnest. Phil, in earnest they will find that they will get caught very quickly look at the length of the main field as it courses its way through set set by the way is the leading fishing town fishing town of the Mediterranean in France well the peloton's gone fishing now they're looking for six riders and there they are on the climb as they snake the way across set and onto the hill what a cruel approach uh, to the finishing line there's much flatter ways believe me the peloton Bradley Wiggins keeping well out of trouble right up near the front of the rider this man is zigzagging, zigzagging his way it's nine percent this climb and it doesn't relinquish all the way to the summit it is a toughie well his advantage is really getting wiped away very quickly indeed and in fact it's a lotto Bellisol on the front I think they will try and set a reasonable tempo but not a full-on tempo Phil because they want to make sure that Andre Greipel stays in the main field once they go over the summit of the climb one kilometer to the top for the Danish rider he may carry some hopes if he can get away they are now ripping off the front of the peloton the breakaway has been passed Cadell Evans has seen this as an opportunity once again a little sharp steep climb and Evans has come to the front of the main field here to try and rip the race apart he's got his teammate Philippe Gilbert just behind him the response coming from Lotto Bellisol not too far back uh, the reason Mark is to try and get rid of Cavendish Cavendish in trouble the sprinter this was his big wonder could he get over the top here uh, this is George Hincapi who's made the big effort to cause the split he is now sitting off Morkoff is wondering where they all are as the road narrows he's nearly at the summit oh he's really trying so hard just to keep those pedals going up and down at the bottom of his machine there to stay in contact with himself there's another little move coming here this is Coffin is trying to warm it up Markov is still leading but he's only got about 23 seconds over the peloton and Evans is really stamping on the pedals this afternoon well good for him it looks as though it's Michael Rogers in the light uh, blue jersey trying to control him another rider has just launched an attack here this is a Katusha rider who's taken up the challenge and Evans is after him he's out to grab seconds where he can any way you can attack in the Tour de France this year is an ideal opportunity for Cadell Evans to try and pull back time oh, Markov, he can oh. hardly get up to the top of this climb come on my man keep going it is such a steep climb it's only third category they're up behind him now as he comes to the top this is the rider from Katusha who is reaching him but again I'm not sure whether Bradley Wiggins is applying his usual thing which is to keep his own tempo and ignore the attack 
attacked because he's in trouble, I think. Well, the best thing for him to do is to ride at his own tempo, get over the top of this climb, regroup with his teammates. There is a man, once again, once he's in difficulty, Phil, he assumes control. But it looks as though Markov got passed there by the rider from Katusha. We haven't got close enough yet to pick him out, but here he comes now as he pushes on up the screen here. It could be Gianpaolo Caruso who's gone clear. Evans is after him, and uh, that looks like it is uh, one of the riders from Lotto on the uh, other side of, of Cadell Evans here. Just Francis de Grief, I think. Just behind them was uh, Nicholas Roach, but taking up control and closing down the gap ever so carefully, ever so surely, is Bradley Wiggins. The attack happened, but he controlled it. But you know, the riders are going to note the reaction time of Bradley Wiggins here. It happened in the Alps. He has his one pace up the climbs, and it, sometimes he can cannot claw his way back. Bernard Eno has said that Chris Froome is the stronger of the two and they're defending for the wrong man. Eno was the last French winner of this race in 1985. Well, the Pyrenees will reveal all and they start tomorrow. Well, Evans will not give up till he goes over the summit of this climb. He sees every incline as an opportunity, but I'll have to tell you one thing, Phil, he has not put Bradley Wiggins into any kind of difficulty at all. Wiggins waited and reacted in his own time at his own pace. Also in there in fourth position was Vincenzo Nibali, third overall at the start of the day. Well, they called it a sprinter's stage, but we knew this climb was here. They knew this climb was here as well. They have climbed something of a wall, and now there is a very dangerous descent away from the summit and down to the flat road before the finish. Evans puffing and blowing on the right. Wiggins has recovered, and so too Jürgen van der Broek is up here now. On the left in the black is Chris Froome, the rider in second overall. Side by side, the two teammates. Number three in the white jersey at the back, that is TJ van Garderen. He is the rider who is the best young rider in this bike race here this afternoon. And a lot of people are saying he is as strong as his own team leader. And that, of course, is Cadell Evans. Number nine is Van Garderen, just on our picture there as he sits there at the bottom of there. But he's also doing a sterling job. He's trying to defend for Evans, but at the moment, Evans is quite happy to do the work. No, he's sitting there in that white jersey just at the back. Uh, in front of him is the American rider Chris Horner who is enjoying these steep, nasty little climbs. They're over the top of the climb now. They will plunge back down to the Mediterranean. Now they start the descent. They'll start to search for those gear shifts and they will go up. Cadell Evans, though, we're still going up the mountain now. Cadell Evans won't have any of this. Don't forget, Cadell Evans is a very, very good descender and he wants to see the front of the road on the way down. But what he's did, doing here, Phil, is destroying the chances of the sprinters by going up this climb just at such an incredible tempo. Well, Cap Dagda was one of the spots they all thought would be a sprinter because it's right at sea level on the banks of the Mediterranean. Uh, but this little hill has done the damage as they straggle over the summit. Well, it uh, looks like Lawrence Tundam struggling there as well for Team Rabobank. He's had a hard day this afternoon. If Cadell Evans keeps the tempo going like this, the sprinters will not get themselves back into the race here this afternoon. And I wonder if Cadell Evans is thinking about splitting this all up to give the advantage to his own teammate, Philippe Gilbert because Gilbert was not too far away from the front of this group. Well, Cadell Evans looking over his shoulder to see what's going on now. He's got Jürgen van der Broek on his back wheel. He's got Nabali is here. Wiggins is here. Froome is here. There's an attack gone down the right of the road. Well, it's Orica Green Edge now have decided that they're going to launch the attack now. I can only think that is because they know that their man, Matty Goss, has got himself over the climb in a situation like this. Well, Orica Green Edge might have launched the move there with Michael Albacini, and that would be a good one to go for. Vandenbroek has officially gone over the top with the two points as the winner of the climb. Cadell Evans took a point for second place over the top of the climb. Those are the big names of the Tour de France on the sprinter's stage. Well, uh, supposedly a sprinter stage but the sprinters will now have to try and scramble over the last 12 and a half miles of this race or 21 kilometers if they want to have some glory this afternoon they've got around about a kilometer and a half over the top of this mountain uh, called the Mont Saint Clair then they'll drop down to the Mediterranean again and if they get organized at the front end of the race the sprinters will not see the peloton again today no, they'll keep the pressure on now. Uh, they have 23 kilometres to race over the top. It's already down to just over 20. They're looking for the 20 kilometres to go banner. Uh, Bradley Wiggins uh, 
at the end of a day is now having to really be alert here this is a tricky old technical descent the riders have got to watch where they're going now well could L Evans uh, put the pressure down Bradley Willins Wiggins is there in the yellow jersey sitting in about seventh or eighth position just in front of him a couple of riders ahead of him is uh, Jürgen Vandenbroek he's got a bunch of riders from Radio Shack Nissan I noticed Chris Horner was there very sharp right hand bend and uh, Wiggins is now trying to get up to the back wheel of Cadell Evans in this long line as they catapult them say off the climb and then we will get down to the basement but it's not all over it is still very difficult and the people waving at the camera they almost lost their arms well the pressure is still on uh, Hutterovic has got himself over the top of this climb and uh, just about in contact with the main field now he is number 143 there Phil he's a very very fast sprinter from Belarus yes he is and if he's on the back he might get himself to the front there is still time to get to the front we're looking for the 20 kilometers to go back there it is only half a banner today but they're underneath it that's probably because of the wind little bit of a move now by Uskatel as they try to uh, continue a poor tour and get themselves a result this looks like it might be Jorge Azanza who's made a bit of a move at the front but they're slowly pull it, pegging him back here well we still 20 kilometers and 12 miles to go to the finish as the riders now check each other out to see who is in this group Team Sky are trying to bring a little symbol of normality to the front of the peloton we'll take a quick break Roll of the Belgian squad Lotto Belisol. One, two, three, four riders on the front. Number five from that team there is Andre Greipel, looking for another stage victory at this year's tour. You can tell you're almost in the sea because at the finishing line, uh, three gannets have just flown over. You very rarely see those over the land. As we're now seeing the leaders here pace the riders towards the finish, Sargon is beginning to luck as though he's in a very strong position. He's locked onto the wheel, the green jersey onto the wheel of Andre. Greipel it is down to about 12 seconds well if these two riders could get into the outskirts of the town of Cap Dag they would have a very good chance of surviving but here Phil on these long straights they're in sight of the main field all of the time and I think that all uh, Lotto Belisol are trying to do is keep them in their sights you know over the uh, last 10 kilometers we've covered it <laughs> in 12 minutes and 5 seconds that's 30 miles an hour yes just on 50 kilometers an hour these boys are coming crashing into the finishing line in Cap Dag since we came off the mountain you can't get it any flatter than this right now but the wind is the problem and the riders are at the top of their speed now these two boys well of course they deserve the win they're the aggressors of the day but the peloton doesn't think like that on uh, Alexander Vinokurov doing longer turns at the front now Albacini is willing to help him when the cameras pull back it's usually not for good reason for the breakaways no it gives us an idea of how the main field is progressing the group of Mayo zone the yellow jersey group but more importantly today it should be Andre Greipel's group he's got his teammates up alongside him they are dedicated to him they are trying to get him into a position to get himself another stage victory but locked on his wheel is his arch enemy and arch rival Peter Sagan well the score between the two is 2-1 at the moment Andre Greipel won in Rouen uh, and Saint-Quentin Sagan won in Serang he won in Boulogne and he won again in Metz and so they're going to go head to head yeah, the first two sprint victories by Peter Sagan were on slightly different terrain. They were more uphill and more to the liking of Peter Sagan. But when it came down to Metz, and uh, I have to admit on that occasion, Andre Greipel was sprinting after replacing his dislocated shoulder, and he still got second place. Yes, and he was in quite uh, severe pain as well. But the team is believing in him now because they are doing all of the chasing as we nip through this holiday area of France. And this is the big weekend for the French. It's Bastille Day. Listen to the crowd. Out into the silence of the roundabout there. 12 seconds of gap. What a ride they're doing, Paul. A phenomenal ride to just hold off a charging main field as we're looking at here. But they've got the organisation in the peloton. The peloton has that advantage. There are four riders from Lotto Belisol who are chasing the two men in the front position. And they're still holding on to around about that 10 second advantage. They are ticking off the gaps. The next big banner they will see though across the road will indicate five kilometres to go to the finish. Still a long way, 5k 
okay to the finish three miles the wind indicating on the union flag there everybody's diving everywhere here it's still coming across they're turning now into a headwind now this may slow them down a little bit 10 seconds the gap lotto down to four riders but still three riders in front of andre greipel uh, this is the men at the back end of this group of riders just struggling to stay in contact that was crazy the way they've come over that roundabout almost knocking each other off they're desperate when the wind blows you're desperate if you allow the wheel in front of you to gain one foot it usually gains 10 meters and you've gone so they've got to keep the pressure on here we go we are approaching now 10 kilometers to go a uh, five kilometers to go to the finish i've even lost caught part of the course now well, look that, at that crowd down there well that's three miles it's still the organization the orchestration of the peloton is being done by lotto bellisol five kilometers to go for them now and still that gap is coming down slowly slowly down to nine seconds advantage for the two leaders albacini and vinikurov the only difference between this and a normal sprint finish is everybody is at the top end of the game and there's not just rushing in there's the swiss flag for michael albacini the belgian flag on the right well that's for the team of andre greipel because he is german well if he wins the stage today phil i think he'll be an honorary belgian by the end of today because the belgians will be all over his support and if Hutrovic wins well no he's not a frenchman but he rides on a french team so they might count that on bastille then i think that would be acceptable in a situation like this uh, these two men are really burying themselves this afternoon into this wind alexander vinikorov probably in his last participation of the tour de france has taken this opportunity to say farewell i think to the spectators around the world this is Cadell Evans is right in there too, Peter Sagan in the green jersey, I think uh, Vincenzo Nibali, it's amazing to see Phil, we're looking now at just inside three kilometres to go. And they won't give up, they continue to give the best shot because it is not a totally, totally flat run-in, it is a very technical run-in, if they can just get out of sight again, but the peloton is virtually regrouping as the wind has changed direction. Well, they're making that big left-hand sweep, and now they're actually on the wrong side of the road if the roads were open, but fortunately the Guard Republican have closed down the road in the entrance into Cap Dag this afternoon as Jürgen Vandenbroek now takes up the pacemaking. On his wheel, though, is Edvald Bosenhagen and we have the advanced peloton has caught the two leaders at two and a half kilometers to go to the finish albacini is out now he did everything he could to get himself the victory he's got no more energy in the gas tank for today's stage at least now we've got an attack by a rabobank rider and i would think it's kieskowski who's given a go there as he moves off to the right of the road Luis Leon Sanchez it is with those lime green uh, 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 glasses oh. on him. He was on the back of the group all of the time now. He is the man who really could pull off something special this afternoon. He's a great man when it comes out. The French would call his style of riding a baroudeur, a fighter. Well, he's, this is the way he's won stages in the Tour de France but Tour. You've got to take your chances here because the sprinters are preoccupied with the team. And now it's Team Sky getting themselves organised at the front. And this has got to be for Edvald Boysenhagen in the white jersey and number four position there. Well, Michael Rogers is the man setting the pacemaking there, but they're not going to give this present away this afternoon. It's Argos Shimano who take up the chase behind Luis Leon Sanchez. Well, I'm not too sure how many are left here in, uh, with Argus Shimano, but uh, we'll try and catch up with him as soon as he comes into our view. It could be Matthew Sprick who's making the move for Argus Shimano. Well, there's no one rattling the cage of Sky. They're just sitting at the front of this group, but they may well be trying to lead this out for their man, Edvald Bosenhagen. All of the pressure of the chase has disappeared now from Lotto Belisol. There's a little bit of a ripple now as we start to get to one and a half kilometres to go. And there's a nasty little roundabout just inside of the last kilometre. Well, this is the little drag away from the highway onto the direct approach back now into Cap Dag. Two riders have got themselves together as we're watching Luis Leon Sanchez now and a rider from the Argus Shimano team they've lost their sprinters uh, Tom Vilas and Marcel Kittel are out of the tour as we go under one kilometer to go we might have a little surprise result here because Luis Leon Sanchez and the unknown rider from August and I'm gonna go for Mathieu Sprick the French rider on there as Boysenhagen is sitting on the back wheel of uh, 
of uh, Motenhagen's uh, on the back wheel of Wiggins. Of Wiggins, I couldn't get it out anymore. As Wiggins tries to take his teammate across the gap with a terrific turn of speed that he's famous for as they race up towards the line now. There's nobody knows who the boy in white is, the computer, and Wiggins has gone by. He is going to lead out Boysenhagen to the win, or is he going to take it for himself? This is the tricky part of the course as Wiggins now moves over. He's giving it to Edward Boysenhagen. Andre Greipel on his wheel. Greipel's going to be too quick. Is Sargon going to take out Greipel as Peter as Sargon comes to the line? It's on the photo. For me, though, Andre Greipel has leveled the stage win score three all with Peter Sagan. Well, well, that was amazing. Look at her face on this man in the middle here, Andre Greipel. Looks down, it's the lunge for the line that gives him that extra few centimetres to get in the victory. And how happy is he this afternoon? Well, what a finish. And it's such an, a rare sight to see the yellow jersey of the Tour de France try to deliver a teammate for the victory. What a turn of speed by Wiggins that was. And Peter Sagan there, Phil, is going to extend his lead in the green jersey points classification by a huge amount here this afternoon Bosenhagen crosses the line in third place but what a mad dash for the line look at this one more time Sagan there was right on the wheel of the man in the black jersey there the man from Germany in the lunge for the line close. it was oh so very close but what a race over the last 20 kilometers or so absolutely superb the two sprinters got first and second in the end but at the end Paul it was never going to be a sprint finish that was such a hard race well I tell you at one stage there was only 10 bike riders left in that leading group but all of the top four riders were in it and Wiggins Evans Nibali and of course uh, the uh, the man in fourth place uh, Froome was there as well and the job was done by those riders coming in the lead out men there one punch the sky job done they've got their man to the finish and they won here's Thomas Buckler and the Japanese Arishiro they're coming home clocks tick by one and a half minutes already they're not going to worry about losing time. But don't forget, Phil, it is a flat stage and time gaps have been open. And as I said at the start of the day, the worst enemy of a bike rider in this part of the world is the wind. And once again, she ripped this race to pieces. Yes, it always makes for exciting races. The leaders of the Tour de France have to be careful. Well, you know, this man is amazing. And so is that man. I think today he won the green jersey as long as he stays out of trouble over the next week of the Tour de France. A little uh, rush around the port here and uh, the result confirmed that Andre Greipel nearly five hours today ahead of Peter Sagan, Boysenhagen of Sky in third place, the sprinter from France uh, fourth for Sebastian Eno and Dalil Impey coming really good for South Africa and Orica Greenes there in fifth. Uh, Philippe Gilbert eighth, Velitz uh, despite his fall today he got ninth and Danilo Hondo uh, completing the top ten. now to live pictures here on the road of the Tour de France a familiar sight uh, Team Sky all at the front for the yellow jersey Bradley Wiggins but that breakaway of 11 has really got going now Paul it's over 10 minutes and approaching 10 and a half well you know it's an ideal situation really for Team Sky because none of those riders are at all dangerous in the overall standings I think the best place rider is Sandy Kassar and he's 55 minutes behind but this race today Phil is all about what's coming up at the end in the second half of the race once they've gone through the sprint point and the feeding zone those two first category climbs there will still be a race in the main field for the overall jersey well there are definitely two races in progress at the moment the men who want the stage win up front and the battle for the yellow jersey uh, here as Badley Wiggins discussing things with Christian Canise uh, the way it's going Paul this breakaway is building before we get to the two climbs and as you can see the clouds are rolling in from the direction of Spain across the Pyrenees now if it rains today this will put a new face on the stage no it certainly will when it rains in the Pyrenees it gets very very cold over the top of these mountains and that could very well be the case over the next few days anyway and I was just wondering that if there was a cold wet day in the Tour de France how would Bradley Wiggins handle that because he's such a skinny yeah. guy these days I wonder if he'd be able to keep himself warm back and the crowd cheering him through the department of the Ariège right now and the breakaway just peaked at 12 minutes and five seconds these are the riders who got clear uh, they started with an attack by Peter Sagan Stefan Kreisweig and Sergio uh, Paulinho and they were quickly joined by eight others and uh, now there's 11 men 12 minutes ahead
Well, about six kilometres away from the, uh, the sprint point of the day, and one man wearing the green jersey will certainly be looking to try and get that because an extra 20 points in the bag will almost make him unbeatable on the road to Paris in that green jersey competition. The uh, Orica Green Age boys really have missed out this afternoon not being able to tame the man who leads that competition, Peter Sagan. The green S there is where the sprint point is, but after that, it's a different change. It's a change of gears, it's a change of tactics, and a change of terrain as well because we go over the first of these two very big mountains. The first one, Le Port de l'Est, is a tough first category climb, but I think the last one is going to be magnificent. It's narrow, tricky, and dangerous on the descent. Well, it won't be too long now before they arrive in Tarascon, uh, Tarascon sur Ariège. That's where the sprint is today. And bet your life that Peter Sagan will give it his best shot for 20 points. Looking at the lovely sign there, the Chateau de Foix. Uh, that's where they'll see that chateau. They finish just in the shadow of it, but that's still a little while away. As the crow flies, we're not far from the finishing line today, but off we go. A nice ramble around the Pyrenees shortly. But Peter Sagan in a brilliant position now, Paul, to net 20 points at the sprint point. Yeah, this man has ridden well uh, throughout the Tour de France. We saw him preparing for the Tour de France in the Amgen Tour of California, where he won five individual stages. He followed up with four stages at the Tour of Switzerland, and, and he said at the start of the Tour to us, Phil, he said, I'll be happy if I won one stage or maybe two. But I think he's probably absolutely ecstatic with three and a massive lead in the green jersey points because he's got 296 points against uh, Matty Gosses at about 232. The sprint uh, is five, five kilometres away. Yeah. Three miles still to go down to the sprint today. We follow this railway track now right the way through uh, Tarascon and uh, most years we normally get a glimpse of the steam locomotive that works these tracks in this region and let's hope we do today it's a bit chillier today down to 62 Fahrenheit that's about 15 or 16 Celsius a bit cooler than normal 12 miles per hour the wind but they seem stronger than that down in the valleys I must say cloudy and I would say a threat of rain today so with three miles still to go to the sprint as we watch the peloton they don't look as though they're hanging around any longer i would have thought 12 minutes is enough bernard eisel of team sky is tapping out the message on the front we'll take a break see you shortly well uh, the weather changes quick in the uh, pyrenees we've seen the riders climb up into the mist now and it's probably quite chilly on the arms uh, 64 degrees fahrenheit is still officially i think you might find it's colder now as they climb up towards the top of the climb right well here's the interesting one let's see who you picked today and of course you made the decision like i did when i picked the winner today before the breakaway went tell us so we'll have a look at our road id challenge fan predictions you're saying 12 percent for cadell evans 11 for peter sagan you must have known something i didn't know nine percent for chris Froome and nine percent for nibali so uh, the majority going for evans the race uh, man who's in fourth place overall but Peter Sagan could win anyway head on over to roadid.com forward slash drive make your predictions for tomorrow's stage a clue no major climbs tomorrow just some small ones and we're heading to Poe you'll be entered with to win daily prizes and a 2013 at Trek Madon there's the mist I'm talking about as we climb up the Pyrenean slope well, there's no effort being made yet because Bernard Eisel riding at the front isn't a great climber and he wouldn't be here if the pressure was on. Coming up behind him is his teammate Christian Kniss. This is uh, Stefan Kreisweg at the front here, the Dutchman. And uh, looking very strong. It's his first Tour de France and if they let him go towards the finish, watch out for him. Philippe Gilbert knows him, he's after him. Yeah, well, just look at the road surface now, Phil. Well, that mist that's coming in over the mountains, it's starting to get just a little bit of... Uh, moisture on the surface that's going to make the descent very dangerous and you want to be careful mm. you don't take too many risks and the riders in the main field will know that because the team managers will, will pass that information on to them and we could sure. see a few boys taking some risks I hope they've got the tire pressures right today absolutely they don't want them bullied hard today for especially for the way down the mountain as they go around those bends at between 45 and 50 or even quicker miles per hour you look down through the forested land you'll just see the uh, laboring peloton still 1434 the gap they are not making any impression i took a look though rui costa just won the tour of switzerland by the way and he's in the tour de france um just took a look at the face of sagan at the moment paul he is under a little bit of pressure coming towards the summit 
looking here at the back of the main bunch of riders at the moment as they continue up towards the summit right on the back is Ruben Perez as the leaders themselves are now going up into the mist visibility coming down as we get towards the top of the climb of the Port de l'Air there's been absolutely no progress at all by the peloton in fact if anything the leaders have just added about five or six seconds to their advantage well Phil I have to admit we uh, expected this might happen in the Pyrenees because in the Pyrenees the weather changes very dramatically and quickly and uh, this is going to make for a completely different race now because we're going to go down this descent with wet roads and uh, if it's wet over the next climb of the day it'll even be slippery going uphill because it's so narrow and so steep yes absolutely and uh, we're going right into the cloud now as you can see visibility is coming uh, a little bit less some uh, moisture on the camera lens as well there's what we're talking about in the distance we won't get to the real very tops of the Pyrenees this time but it's cold now the leaders are still a little way from the summit the peloton hasn't gained anything if anything it's lost five seconds on my computer since this climb started we'll take a break when we come back we'll go over the top of the leaders They're going to watch, uh, and I'm sure they're going to hit Wiggins and his Sky Team on the next climb, not the one they're on at the moment, because there's still time to make time on the way down to Foire de Day today. Very, very rapid descent all the way down into the town of Foire. So as they come up towards the summit now, we're just about going to see who goes over the top first here because of the spots of mist on our, and it looks as though it was uh, Paulinho on the left of the road there, first over the top of the mountain. Yeah, Sergio Paulinho on the left-hand side in the blue and yellow jersey, Olympic silver medalist uh, from Athens and a winner of the stage of the Tour de France into gaps a while back. Still, it's Bernie Eisel uh, helping out his team this afternoon. Amazing to see, and uh, even up into third place in that line of Sky Riders is the world champion, Mark Cavendish. I wonder if he has got uh, the sprinting legs tomorrow, Phil, because I think it's a fairly flat day on the road down to Pope, and it would be a great place for him to get to a sprint victory. Well, still sat at the back is uh, Thomas Vukler, and. Uh, We've seen Mark Cavendish up near the front today, so I wonder when the last time was he was going up in the lead on the first category climb, but what they've got to watch on the way down now are the slippery road surfaces. It's just a smither of dampness. It could be treacherous if they're not careful. No, they need to take care and attention, as uh, one of the old famous uh, race referees used to say. Yes. Looking down, everybody knows and everybody is concerned about the descents in the Tour de France as much as they are going uphill sometimes, especially when it's a little bit damp. And they're also concerned, Phil, about the, the change in temperature because it's probably half the temperature that it was at the start town of Limoux this morning, which is famous, by the way, for a sparkling white wine. It is, but the riders won't have partaken that last night, I can assure you, as they are now on the next stage of the Tour de France. It's the 15th day of racing in the Tour de France today finishing uh, a week from today in Paris there's one rest day on Tuesday and there's uh, two uh, hugely mountainous days Wednesday and Thursday now well, what's happened here this is uh, is Cyril Gauthier. yeah this is uh, one of the, uh, the chain is off he's going to try and get it on there uh, I think probably the, the better the part of Valor off. would be to stop and do it at the side of the road well I think his gears are also uh, wrapped around the rear end of the bike there so it might be a bicycle change here well, that is, that is bad luck there for him, and uh, it took him a long time before he decided to fight. I think he has crunched up his gears. He's trying to get the chain on himself. I'm not sure whether... No. no. There's the new bike. He should be OK, but he's going to have to take one or two more little risks to catch up with the boys. You can hear the cacophony of car horns here, not showing any respect to the cyclist who's just got back on the bike. Well, that's bad luck there to happen. That probably happened, Phil, because he was hitting a couple of bumps and... Uh, and uh, what happened the chain jumped up it came off the chain ring and then just wrapped around the gears and that uh, made a, a dreadful mess of his posh bike well he's got a new one now and it'll be dry the bikes they carry identical bikes for spurs for all of the team on those following cars so he he gets the bike made for him well uh, i would say phil he lost himself 30 to 45 seconds yeah. uh, with that a uh, little bit of a problem now he's going to have to take some serious risks but because he's in the breakaway there's not that many cars behind the breakaway so he can't use the cars to get himself back into the race and how good a descender is he paul because this road is looking a little bit uh, treacherous just now 
No, it certainly is. And uh, you can see the water coming in off the, the Pyrenees. That will all flow down into the river Ariège and that will flow down into the Lake river Garon. And then from Garon it pours out into the Atlantic just around about Bordeaux. There's the peloton. They're still climbing up, remember, and they're still over 14 and a half minutes behind. Vorganov, the Russian champion, went over the top in second place behind the what they call the vice champion of the Olympics, uh, Sergio Paolini, who got silver medal in Athens in 2004. Just behind uh, Paolo Bettini, but he couldn't really do much to uh, challenge Paolo Bettini because Bettini took off with two laps to go. Everybody expected the attack on that day, but nobody apart from Sergio Paolini or Phil could do anything at all about it. Just to complete the order over the top for you, it was Philippe Gilbert paying attention in third place, Kreisweig, Martin Bellitz and uh, then Luis Leon Sanchez. They're the only point scorers, it was 10 for Paulinho, the winner, but this is good news for Frederick Kesiakov, who is the leader of the King of the Mountains. These points are going to riders who haven't featured before. It's a perfect scenario, he'll keep his polka dot jersey tonight. Well, this is what it's like at the back end of the race when you're trying to get yourself into the breakaway which you tried hard to get into a breakaway of 11 riders this man had a very unfortunately timed uh, mechanical incident when his chain jumped off and uh, actually uh, ripped off the rear mechanism from his bike now he's got to take all kinds of risks and it's even worse when you see the road conditions the surface conditions here Phil because it's very very slippery especially with the you know that this rain has only just come in and put a thin film yeah. of moisture over the road look at this uh, guy crossing over the road it's ridiculous as they come down in these treacherous conditions he's got to break evenly otherwise his bike will lock up for short there's very little rubber on the surface on a racing tire and he's got to take that little extra chance the good news is the leaders with the lead they've got are not going to push on down this hill but the next one they will because they could break clear on the next descent heading into Foix look at that Paul he had to really steady for that right hander no he certainly did I'm um, just looking around the corner all of the time Phil and I cannot see the cars the convoy of cars behind the 10-man breakaway group so this young man here is going to have to do a, a lot of risk taking to get around there and he's actually not taking very good lines around these corners uh, as they say in French he's going around these corners in squares the thing is we're over the mountain and the conditions on this side are worse than on the other side team car up alongside him now uh, trying to uh, help him uh, warn him about the corners and explain how the corners are well, we were coming up on a full hairpin bend there but our cameras have cut away to see Bernard Eisel laboring at the front on drier roads as they continue to climb with a gap of over 14 and a half minutes but just getting the spots of rain on the camera now on the way up the mountain So uh, we're now seeing a different face of the Tour de France, the descent here in rather wet conditions for the breakaway and we'll see if indeed uh, Cyril Gauthier can rejoin those leaders on the way down. They continue up towards the summit of this first uh, first category call of the day. You saw Carsten Kroon there actually reach out and grab that newspaper which he wanted, not to read the headlines during his descent, but to put it up his jersey and cut out the wind ripping through and giving him a cold chest because that's how you start a sickness. Yep, that certainly is. Over to the right hand side. Um looks like it's uh, Richard Roberts has come back up no no it's not it's the white jersey there's so many T. white jersey in the tour this yeah. year you know you get confused when you see them but that's TJ Van Garderen the leader of the best young rider competition he's only really got one challenger in that event Phil I would have to say and that is uh, Thibaut Pino the young Frenchman 14 minutes and three seconds so at the end of the day they're coming up to the summit this is the peloton having pulled back approximately half a minute and there's only 53 kilometers to go on the front right having now put on these uh, racing capes as we call them that is Christian Canise uh, also Bradley Wiggins himself has pulled on a yellow racing cape over the top of his yellow jersey as the riders now start to uh, wrap up for the wet descent yeah because what they're concerned about Phil is the chill factor the difficult thing as well over the top of a climb like this is actually getting your racing cape on because if you look at the flags there there's a there's a large amount of wind a heavy wind buffeting the riders and it's a dangerous thing to yep. try and do but you've got to do it you've got to take the risk because you don't want to get too cold on the descent especially when you know that straight off this descent you're back up into climbing 
Well, actually, you mentioned the wind, Paul. In fact, it's gone up by six miles an hour since they started that climb. On the other side of this Port de Lair, it is quite strong. Take a look at those French flags as they go over the top. Yeah, they really are being buffeted, and I think that's going to go against the breakaway group as we go back to join them. Uh, nobody was dropped at all, apart from one man who had a mechanical incident on the descent, and that, of course, was the young Frenchman Cyril Gauthier. Philippe Gilbert, hand up, wants a drink on the way down now. As we start the long descent, still no Cyril Gauthier. Our computer's still saying he's 40 seconds behind and chasing. Hopefully he's got a little bit closer than that just at the moment, as we now have 10 riders on the descent. Yeah, Gilbert now uh, I think will be starting to dream about a victory. You know, he was such a dominant rider last year. And I wonder if he can get over this steep climb, the next steep climb mm. that the riders are facing up to, because uh, Gilbert is not one of the best climbers in the long calls, but in the Tour de France last year he rode very well on a couple of the mountain stages. And if he gets over the top of this climb and Peter Sagan gets left behind, the Belgian could be looking at a stage victory. Well, I feel as though Peter Sagan will get left behind on this climb as Cyril Gauthier continues to race flat out. His team car will be shouting him on as uh, he now races forward. Well, the team cars in the breakaway up front, the riders about call for their team cars, and uh, that might help us. It'll go to if they start lining up behind the leaders as he continues his chase down. Well, he needed really, Phil, to make the junction once be before he got to the bottom of uh, the descent. Absolutely. Because otherwise, it's going to be very difficult for him to bridge on the next climb. Yep. Yeah, it's absolutely true because uh, the climb, once the descent stops at about halfway down in height from the summit, they then start the climb again. We don't go as high as where we've just been, so we may not have the problem of the mist on the next climb. The challenge on the next climb, believe me, is the steepness of it and the narrowness of it. And then, of course, it's all eyes down for the big descent to Foix for the finishing line, which is very, very slightly uphill in Foix. So Team Sky has still got everything under control, Isil has gone from the front now, the pressure also hurt Mark Cavendish a little bit, but the rest of the riders here on the front looking after Bradley Wiggins, we'll take a break. We'll pick up here Cyril Gauthier, he's now timed at 24 seconds behind, but there's the cars in front of him, and believe it or not, the climb has just started, he's going to get on the back, and he's going to be climbing straight away. Well, what a super effort, Paul, but what a time to catch up, they've just started the climb. Yeah, it really is the wrong time to catch back to the main group. But, you know, he hasn't quite done it yet because he's uh, just about making contact with a convoy of cars behind him. But at the front in that group yeah. of riders, they're starting to get themselves down to the business of going uphill very fast. Well, they know this is the last climb of the day. This is also the undoubtedly the hardest climb of the day with sections at 13%. It will become a very, very narrow. And once over it, it's basically downhill. It has a steeper section on it of 18%. And that's almost one in four. One in yeah, five. One in five. It's very beastly up at the top, I have to tell you. Narrow, tricky, and a poor surface. Fortunately, although this climb is very narrow and dangerous on the ascent that we're going up, the descent on the on, on the ascent that we're going yep. up, on the descent on the other side, it's actually fairly safe. Yes, it's safe. It's a wider road and it's a clear, but it, it's very, very fast on the other side too. A different skill again for the riders. You know, he's got to be careful now, Cyril Gauthier, that he doesn't uh, let enthusiasm run away with it and race up to those riders because he'll get dropped straight away. He's got to hold his rhythm a little bit and work his way up. Well, the best thing to do would be to uh, just sit on the back of the car for uh, 20 to 30 seconds each time, and I don't think the referees will uh, punish him for that and uh, leap from them one at a time, but stay behind each one for 15 to 20 seconds. That way, he'll get onto the, it'll take him a little bit longer to get back yep. onto the group, but he won't get on there in oxygen debt. Absolutely. We're looking at the peloton here now as they go down at 47 kilometers from the finish. They've gone over the top. The mist is still with them. The good news is that Cyril Gauthier has got behind the race referee's vehicle now. He's almost back on. The bad news is the last climb of the day has already begun. So Gauthier is going to join and he's going to be really paying for that pace he's been setting himself. 
Well, Philippe Gilbert, teammate of Cadell Evans on the front here in the red and black jersey of BMC Racing, looking very comfortable indeed. If he gets to the steepest part of the climb, uh, he'll be looking to try and uh, get rid of Peter Sagan because I think they will all, as, if Sagan goes over the top of this climb in the leading group, they will all start to wonder what they've got to do to beat the Slovakian champion. Two first-timers in our camera there. On the left was Stephen, uh, Stefan Kreisweig, the Dutchman, and on the right was uh, Martin Belitz, the, uh, the Slovak rider. And uh, heading up onto this climb now, which is a brute, the Mur de Peguer. Just see the road surface as well. Uh, the road surface in the Pyrenees completely different to the road surface in the Alps, which is why they often say a different kind of rider rides differently in the Alpine passes and the Pyrenean passes. Here, the road is a very, very difficult, gravelly surface. It's like the chippings are put on top of the tar mm. because of the vast changes in temperature during the summer months. Yeah, the British roads are surface the same way, but they do it to save money, and they're no good after about three weeks, but never mind about that. As we're looking here now at the uh, steady descent of the peloton, nobody taking any chances. Two races, as I've said, going on today. The boys up front racing for the stage. The big favourites back here, they're waiting for the upward slope of the Mieux de Peguerre. Yep, everybody very concerned. Uh, this is the back end of the main field, back with the leading group of riders. Peter Sagan has uh, thought to himself, right, well, the best way for me to stay in this group is for me to set the pace making on this climb, and hopefully I can put these guys to sleep. Almost eight kilometres or five miles to the top of this mountain. Doesn't go as high as the previous one, so we might just dip in below the mist. This is the face of Gorka Izigia. He is a good climber. He lives in the area of the mountains. He comes from Basque land in northern Spain. Paulinho in the black. He's come through. He's being followed by the champion uh, of Russia, puffing and blowing a little bit. Watch out for this man here, the youngster, uh, Stefan Kreisweik. He might try to pull a trick here and lead out his teammate, Luis Leon Sanchez, who's checking around to see who's struggling. <laughs> He's been like this, he's been in the breakaway on a number of occasions, he's been in the breakaway many, many times through the history of the Tour de France, or his participation, with the man on the front in the white jersey there, Sandy Kassar. Kassar will be trying to think about how he can get himself a victory. He's won three stages throughout his career at the Tour, and has the man on the right-hand side at Luis Leon Sanchez. Tactically though, Phil, Team Rabobank are in a better position. Just looking here, this is Mark Cavendish, isn't it, coming down? And yeah. he's still at the front of the race on the way down as well. He's got a clear road. He's had a great day out today, Mark Cavendish, the sprinter. Yeah, I think he's uh, enjoyed riding with the lads over the climbs. It's something that he doesn't normally get a chance to do, but uh, it is also a chance for him to show off his world champion's jersey. And the white jersey with the rainbow bands around the middle is only worn by the current champion of the world. Oh. in the discipline that you've won it in absolutely good for him too uh, having a, a great day in the first mountains of the area of the pyrenees today peloton snaking down they're still on the descent they descend half the distance of the height they climbed and then they climb again yeah, but uh, the next climb of the day phil is completely different it's not quite as long but it's a lot more vicious as we go back to kreisweg in the orange and blue jersey of uh, rabobank as you can see from uh, his shin on his left leg there uh, he's also one of the riders who've been involved in uh, plenty of the accidents that have happened over the first week of the tour de france well, i think it's easier to list the names of those who haven't fallen off than those who have right now in the tour de france there's 163 riders still left in this race and we started with 198 so 35 riders have gone out and the vast majority probably 30 of them have gone out with quite serious injuries and broken bones no, definitely. Uh, I don't think I can remember a Tour de France where there's been so much carnage on the roads in the opening week and massive pile-ups. Mainly, I think, probably the, pro the fault of the riders who've been taking lots of crazy risks to get themselves to the front of the pack. Well, so Gautier, the rider at the back, pulling a face there. He made that huge effort. He's got on just as the climb started, five or six hundred metres after the climb began. He rejoined. He needs a little chance to try and recover. These boys are not racing now to stay away from the advancing peloton. They are racing now to outwit the others so they can go to what I think will be a lone victory by someone. And on the way up here, the first object will be to get rid of Peter Sagan in the green jersey. Yeah, you cannot take a man like Peter Sagan to the finishing line in an armchair like this, Phil, because uh, we'll get a chance to see one of his very, very famous victory salutes, his enthusiastic victory salutes, may I add. 
Absolutely, we can't wait to see him win again, see what he comes up with. We've had Forrest Gump, we've had the Hulk, and we've had the Dancing Chicken so far. Now, number four there, just shaking his hands out. A little bit of pins and needles, maybe, as he grips the handlebars very hard. There's Philippe Gilbert, the flag of Slovakia on the right of the road. We've just gone by that, so Peter Sagan has, certainly has built his fan club around this route. This is only the shallow part of the climb, Paul. We're waiting for the top. It's actually the main road, this is, that takes you to the Col de Pau. Uh, but we turn off shortly. Yes, we do, and uh, these riders then find the very steep part up at the top. Here it's around about 3 or 4%, but at uh, the top in the final kilometres, it peaks out at 18%, the maximum grade. Interesting enough, you mentioned the Croatian, the um, Slo Slovakian mm -hmm. flag at the side of the road mm -hmm. there. There are two Slovakians in the breakaway this afternoon. Peter Sagan's not the only man from Slovakia. In fact, he's joined by Martin Velic. Good point, and if, uh, if his brother was here, then we'd have all three. A full, full house. <laughs> So Gautier dancing on the back, hard to climb, and the two rubber bank boys have put themselves in a perfect position here now. And young Stefan Kreisweig leading out uh, John, um, Luis Leon Sanchez because he's the most likely to go forward, I think. Well, uh, these two riders, as I said, Phil, uh, they have the advantage of numbers, and I think that's why Kreisweig has come to the front. They know they have to dislodge Peter Sagan. If anybody in this group wants to get a victory this afternoon, I think they also have to dislodge Philippe Gilbert as well, because Gilbert is riding a lot better. How, how narrow that road is. 18%. This is the steepest part of the climb. That's a good move. Two rides on the same team blocking the road. Watch out, Bill, Bill, uh, Gilbert saw the twitch by Sanchez and he's straight onto his back wheel. That was the move. And Gorka is a gear. He's going to cross the gap if he can. Sagan is under pressure. They've got to get rid of him on this slope. Sagan is under pressure, but so too is everybody else responding to that attack. Gorka, Gorka is a gear in the orange jersey. He's trying to get across. So too is Sandy Kassar. They know how important it is, but they also know of the reputation of the man in the orange and blue jersey. Luis Leon Sanchez whoops a little bit too close for comfort that yes and this is really steep here now the road is quite narrow it gets narrower as they go through the woods big effort uh, from uh, Luis Leon Sanchez we switch back to the main peloton still being spearheaded uh, by Mark Cavendish now they hit the car climb how much longer can Mark stay on the front of this group they started the last climb now well I think Cavendish can stay there Phil for a good uh, two or three kilometers but once we get to that steep part that the leaders are now on he's gonna have a hard time uh, dragging his body over the top of this mountain this afternoon but he's done his job for the team as too has Bernie Eisel he's been absolutely superb today Mark Mark Cavendish, Sylvain Chavanel was number 192. He's not very happy with his race today at all. Cavendish now finding he's slowing down a little bit. These three are hitting, but that is Vorganov trying to cross the gap, I think. So no, Sandy Sanchez, Kassar. Sandy Kassar, rather, who's coming across. Yeah, but we you know what? The man who's chasing, trying to limit the losses on the front of the remnants of that group, is wearing a green jersey. It's ah. Peter Sagan. Well, this is Vorganov just here now. He is in a little bit of bother at the back of this group. Paulinho is going off the back, so too is Christchek. A uh, Christ-like rather. A uh, little Sil Gautier in the green jersey at the front, trying to fight as best he can. But this is the split, and it's being driven by Luis Leon Sanchez, who's won in Oriac, San Giron, which is literally down the road from Foix and San Flor last year. He knows this region as well. No, he certainly does. He's a, he's a great animator. He had a very difficult start to the Tour de France this year, but he's done the damage, the damage including a casualty of his own teammate. There on the right-hand side, we're now starting to see them, probably for the first time in the Tour, the Basque flag. All the cheers here. Gilbert, Izegir, Casar, Sanchez are the leaders now. Sandy Casar on the far right. He watches the moves, sees if he's got a chance, and then goes across. But look, you know, in the distance, Paul. He's still struggling and holding these boys in sight. The, here he is now. He's joined here with uh, Sebastian Mina, number 77. Sagan is not out of this. Well, he's a fighter. He's a real fighter. And he knows with his downhill ability, because he's a fantastic bike handler, yep. he knows if he can go over the top of this climb with only a 30 or a 45 second deficit, he'll catch them on the descent. 
There's still about uh, two and a half to three kilometers to the summit here. They've got to open the gap on Sagan before the summit. He will fall off this mountain like a stone. He knows it. He's working himself just to keep them in his sights because he'll then say to himself, now watch me. Minar, very happy just to sit on the wheel of the uh, Slovakian national champion in the green jersey at the Tour de France, uh, Peter Sagan. He really is doing a sterling job. The idea for him is to limit his losses. He can't climb like Luis Leon Sanchez, but if he can peg them and keep himself in sight of these leaders, he will catch them on the descent. We're about to see a little bit of movement. There's number one, Cadell Evans, the defending champion, right on the wheel there of the yellow jersey. Well, there's the uh, Knights of the region here in the Ariège. The peloton itself is beginning to shed riders at the back and at the front. There is movements now by Liquid Gas as well. Mark Cavendish is trying to keep it under control though. He is doing a sterling job today. The world champion pedalling Team Sky up the last mountain of the day. I tell you what, Phil, a lot of riders in this field will be saying to themselves that uh, it's pretty tough to be given the stick in a mountain by Mark Cavendish and Bernie Eisel. Normally, they would be the drive riders at the front end of what we call the autobus, the group of sprinters yeah. in the back end of the race who are only in the race to survive for the flat stages. But here, they've got a different agenda this afternoon. They've got to be sending... Uh as, uh, frighteners down the bunch now when they see these riders on the front and showing just how strong Team Sky is no, no one no, helping no, no, no. Luis Leon Sanchez at the front he continues to just the bobbin head at the front and he's never come back has he? Well I'll tell you what 20 to 25 seconds is the gap between the leading group of four and Peter Sagan and the Slovakian national champion has not given this up as a ghost he hasn't, well, he's, he's limited his losses and he's locked in. These boys are not going away from him right now. As Sanchez continues a serious face of the boy in red, Philippe Gilbert, former champion of Belgium. And it looks to me as though Sagan is actually cracking Minar here and he's moving on. Well, he's really hurting himself here, Phil. He knows that with every meter that goes by, he's getting closer to the top of this climb and he wants to stay in contact. If he goes in I contact, then I think we're looking at stage victory number four. This is amazing. He's actually climbing across the gap on the steepest part of the climb. And that will tell you by looking at the face of Sebastian Minar here. Well, he's struggling just to try and stay in contact with Sagan. Sagan has ridden away from him. He is riding a phenomenal ride here, Peter Sagan, and I don't think anybody could have predicted that. But at 22 years of age, Phil, he doesn't even know his own capabilities yet. He hasn't fully developed as a, as a bike rider. He's going to get bigger and stronger when he gets to 25 and 26 years of age. So I wonder where this man is going to go to in the sport of professional cycling. Well, he's building up a fan club, not just in his home country, but around the world here, the Slovakian rider. He's won 60 races this year if he were to win today I bet you he would make it mark it as the best win of the season number 17 having conquered two first category climbs and stayed with the men a perfect scenario they're gonna have to keep the pressure on and nobody's helping Sanchez well Sanchez was the man who took the initiative uh, 18 seconds is the gap back to this man Sagan if he goes I'm telling you Phil if he goes over the top with a 30 to 40 second deficit and that's if he doesn't catch them he will catch them on the descent but well, he's close enough, isn't he? The flags are awaiting the arrival of Bradley Wiggins, but this is where the race is for first place. The play has come from Luis Leon Sanchez. Gilbert was waiting for it, was straight there. Sandy Casar took a little bit longer to get to it. The peloton are massing on the lower slopes. They haven't got to the steep part of the climb yet. No, but they will have a little dig when they get to the steep part of the climb. The main field will start to accelerate as they get closer and trying to position the leaders in the overall standings into the first 15 to 20 places because now we have seen and everybody has seen just how narrow this climb is. And if they can block the climb off, all the rides from Sky at the front, then there's no way the others can attack them. That's how narrow the road is here. So, uh, and the fact there's so many in the bunch indicates to me they've kept the pressure purposely off today, Team Sky. It's up to the others to attack. It certainly is. It couldn't have been a better tactical situation for them to let a breakaway get clear, establish itself. With riders who are not dangerous in the overall standings, and then all they've done is they've set the tempo, allowed the freedom to go. Look at that gap now, Phil. It's 16 minutes, but it's only about 15 seconds between the leading four and Peter Sagan. And just look at the faces on the crowd when they see the green jersey coming through and they recognize him now after two weeks of the Tour de France. Sagan, if he stays exactly where he is, will pounce like a leopard as soon as he goes over the top. 
And that's what he's waiting for. He's just keeping himself in contact with these riders. He's putting himself in all kinds of agony just to stay in contact because he knows he's dreaming of victory number four. He knows how to suffer. They've just made the switch as well, the riders here. And still Mark Cavendish is on the front. Now there's a move, a surge at the front of the peloton, by the way, as Lotto are trying to move up as well. This is still the front of the peloton. Uh, riding very hard is Luis Leon Sanchez. Gilbert is setting his jaw now. Sanchez isn't going to get rid of these riders as they head up towards the summit, that's for sure. We top out at 38.5 kilometres to go, so the one and a half kilometres from the summit. Well, everybody's having a hard day in the main field, and even Thomas Vocal is having a hard time staying in contact. And the man who is dishing out the pain today in the mountains is the fastest sprinter in the world, Mark Cavendish. It's been superb. There is a change at the front now, though. Lotto have taken over to lift up the tempo. So, bet your life, Bradley Wiggins and the strong climbers on Team Sky will now be paying very close attention in the peloton. The gap, though, is approaching 60 minutes to the riders up front. Well, this man battling still to stay in contact, but uh, Jürgen van der Broek will have an attack when we come up to this climb, especially when we get to when we turn off the main road with the peloton at the back, Phil, onto the very steep part of the top of this climb. Luis Leon Sanchez still the leader at the front. Summit now, and look at this. Peter Sagan has just tagged on to the back. He's gone past the fading Luis Leon Sanchez. He's about to carve a trail through to Philippe Gilbert. Sandy Cassar is just ahead, and a Frenchman is going to go over the top of this mountain first. Massive cheers now for Sandy Cassar, but they haven't got rid of their nemesis, that's for sure. Can you believe the cheek of it now? Sagan setting the pace. <laughs> <laughs> well, as I said, Phil, when we talked about in the Amgen Tour of California earlier on this year, I did say that the thing about Peter Sagan at 22 years of age, he still doesn't know what his capabilities are, he doesn't know what he can do, and he's still learning about his body. Well, I think he's learned an awful lot in this last 12 days of the Tour de France. He's going to win that green jersey, he's going to score points on a mountain stage today. He's already won the hard way, halfway sprint point. Hunt, haunted eyes here of Sandy Cassano. Well, we told you it was narrow. There's just room for one right now. I have to tell you one thing, Phil. At least I think the fans are getting uh, getting the sense as well because uh, they were fairly controlled there this afternoon. Yes, very loud, very participant, but safe. Over the summit, Sandy Cassar of France now begins the plunge, he's checking out the damage done, he's got out the saddle, he doesn't want them to come back, because there is a gap there, Philippe Gilbert second, Louis Leon Chantiez is third, and uh, Sagan must be just off our camera behind. Well, Sandy Cassar now, Phil, starting the descent in first position, but, you know, after two or three corners, he will have back on his back wheel a man with a green jersey on. So we're now on the plunge down to Foix, it's a long way, 24 miles, 38 kilometres, and Sagan's still the problem. Now this is the peloton, they've just made that right turn to the steep section of the road, this has got to be where the Lotto team puts in a move. Well, for the first time, part of the climb, it's uh, BMC Racing for Cadell Evans, Evans up into second position there, alongside Jürgen van den Broek, keeping a very close eye on him, is uh, Edval Bosenhagen in that white jersey to the left-hand side, Wiggins is not very far away, but watch out for the acceleration score when it gets really steep. And also, look at the size of the peloton going on to these narrow slopes. It's going to be queue up to go through to attack, and it looks to me as though Cadell Evans might be putting in just an attack on the far right. A little bit of bump of shoulders there with Marcus Burkhardt and the Lotto rider. Well, Evans has decided this is the moment for him to make the move. He's not taking any prisoners this afternoon. Coming across there is Ivan Basso just to nail it back to try and set it up for Vincenzo Nibali, who is in fifth position. 
Cadell Evans has launched an attack immediately they've got onto the steep section Bradley Wiggins is watching the movement he's been caught about seven riders back but Vincenzo Nibali is also there along with Pierre Roland yeah Pierre Roland in the dark green jersey and the green helmet there in fourth position the winner a couple of days ago to La Tussuire moved up there now Chris Froome is on the wheel of the yellow jersey so for the moment Bradley Wiggins is uh, not shown any fear of the attack from Cadell Evans no Cadell Evans is locked off a little bit here we're on the climb of the Mieux de Peguer we've never seen this climb in the Tour de France before but some of these riders have they came here to reconnoitre it, reconnoiter it they know how steep it is and Cadell Evans has gone to the front but I'm not sure he can push home his advantage but he'll try and he will try and go over the top of this climber uh, in first position and then try and do something on the descent Sandy Gassar picked up 10 points over the top of the climb third over the top of a first category climb Unbelievable. Peter Sagan and it is uh, Federico Canuti who is the rider on the left of our picture here setting the pace for liquid gas so that means that Nibali is waiting to pounce looks like Frank Schleck has moved up on the left it's amazing how the form has turned around he was two minutes behind over the top of the very first mountain of the day well move around the outside Team Sky trying to get themselves control they want to be the ones who can set the pace and that of course is Richie Port on the left hand side yep. there moving to the front of the peloton once again you know what Team Sky have done on a lot of these climbs Villa, they've actually asphyxiated the opposition by setting a steady tempo and as Cadell Evans says once the Team Sky get that long uh, organized line of riders on the front it's very difficult to change the pace now obviously we're staying with the interest of the Tour de France here remember there is a group a long way ahead five have got together on the descent Gilbert, Izegir, Sagan, Cassar and Sanchez they are on the way down as a bunch of five at the moment in fact as I spoke Cassar has been projected out on his own so they haven't caught him yet not yet but I don't think it'll be too long before they do because those are four very strong bike riders the damage that this climb is now starting to do is evident so Cassar is heading up the race still alone after he crossed the top of the mountain in first place he saw he had a measurable gap he's given it a go the peloton now all of a sudden is splitting up but what Sky are doing Paul they're trying to bring all the riders up they know how narrow the road is as we go up it's going to become impossible to move out of the pack it'd be very difficult to actually accelerate I think that's why Cadell Evans uh, accelerated the bottom of the climb because he wanted to put himself in a good place they're uh, 20 seconds or so is the difference between uh, the man who leads this race but I think we will see once we get back to the front end of the race we'll see that Sandy Kassar is still there leading he is. but he can't be very far ahead in fact they're saying he's 18 seconds ahead of Gilbert and Sanchez and Sagan has been left behind but look at the difference in the road we've come off that narrow top of the mountain and the road widens out immediately the sweeping bend it's a very very good fast high speed race down to Fouart now they're going to conserve the majority of the 15 minutes I would think by the time they do check in at the finish I think our computers are upside down at the moment because I just noticed there are two riders uh, in front of the, these two and in fact it's Izegir and Sagan who are second and third on the road followed by Gilbert and Sanchez well, our computer is telling us the opposite but it doesn't matter it'll all come out uh, very very shortly we no doubt who the leader is and that is Sandy Kassar continuing to break with absolutely typical move by the Frenchman this and it could well result in first place but not if Peter Sagan has his ideas these well, we presume are second and third this is Sanchez here and Philippe Gilbert meanwhile this is Chris Froome at the moment on the front along with uh, Rishi Port far right is Jürgen Vandenbroek far left in the green is Pierre Roland and uh, Bradley Wiggins watching them all this is the chaos at the back with Jens Voigt number 18 a losing ground just in the moment or is he well big Jens is uh, powering his body up to the top of this climb and he hoped to try and stay in contact with at least one group or another it's a difficult climb this um, but it's difficult to move up through the main field once you've been left behind Termination of Richie Port to the Australian, the Tassie rider here, setting the pace, holding it steady. This is perfect for Bradley Wiggins. Look at his face in yellow, under no pressure whatsoever, and the riders are not launching an attack against him. Well, you might have just noticed uh, Richie Port looking around there, Phil, and he said to uh, Chris Froome, "Is this okay for you?" And Chris Froome, "Yes, it's fine, no problem." <laughs> We're back with Sagan and Izagir here. This, now, is, this is the second chase on the road. These riders are in second and third place on the road. They're only 10 seconds behind Sandy Kassar. As they continue to come down, listen to the wind now whip down there. This is where Sagan will come into his own, and so too Izagir. Look at the style now of Sagan. 
Well, look at the little gap that uh, Izagir went through there. Just around the corner, it's only 10 seconds separates them from Sandy Kassar, and 10 seconds further back is Gilbert and Sanchez. And this is Sagan in second place as he continues down with Izagir. Uh, 16 seconds the official time gap at the moment but they're going to see the lone figure here Sanchez if they can get across this gap they may have to wait till the descent eases just a fraction and get to uh, get into their own chase on the flatter road it's not all downhill to the bottom they'll run down to the river and then we'll come across the river bridge and up to the climb little climb to the finish well I think they ought to look over their shoulders and see uh, how far behind them uh, Philippe Gilbert and Luis Leon Sanchez are because with those two powerhouses they have much more of a chance of catching up to uh, Sandy Kassar meanwhile the race is thinning out at the back but the leaders are still sitting here led by Richie Port all of the riders in the top 10 overall have gone forward with the split as we see Peter Velitz there sliding off the back now well Peter Velitz is having a real up and down Tour de France some days he's in the breakaway some days he's in the top 10 the next day he gets spat out of the back of the main field but there's been no reaction apart from that first initial acceleration from Padel Evans and that's a bit of a surprise to me yeah. there on the far side 51 uh, Vincenzo Nibali number one in the middle of those two is in fact Cadell Evans defending champion the first four riders on the leaderboard so far in the uh, Tour de France are all riding alongside each other there just now and they're using what's left of their climbing domestiques to keep the pace up now it's all breathed in on this narrow section of the road our camera as you can see they can't get through to the front he's trapped here at the back you can see the yellow jersey of Sky. Nibali is the rider immediately to the yellow jersey's right, number 51. Well, just having a look there, number 181, uh, Yanni Brakovic. He's in that leading group here, wears the turquoise jersey. Frank Schleck, amazingly, Phil, in the first few kilometres of this race, yeah. he was off the back. I think he was caught out by the speed over the first climb of the day because the average was about 46 kilometres an hour. They're about to make the junction here, and Peter Sagan is the one who's doing the bulk of the pacemaking to catch up with Sandy Kassar. Puts all his weight over that bicycle now to get every ounce of speed out of it. Saving energy, Kassar's looked over his shoulder, he's seen the arrival, look how fast he's going as he breaks hard, checks it and goes through on the inside and kicks and Sandy Kassar in the flash of an eyelid is now on the defensive. Well now it's turning the tables around isn't it because Peter Sagan is going to put the hammer down on this descent to make sure that Luis Leon Sanchez and Philippe Gilbert don't come back. Well, they're chasing. We haven't got a time gap. They can't be that far behind, of course, as we're looking uh, also at the peloton. There's trouble at the back of the race. Maxime Montfort all of a sudden is losing ground. Well, that's not a surprise because early on, uh, Phil, we were able to uh, earwig into the uh, team car of Radio Shack, and Chris Horner was quite vocal in saying that uh, he thought that Maxime Montfort was having a bit of a hard time today, and there's the proof. There is the proof. He sits 17th overall, has a high position in the Tour de France, of course, but look at uh, the yellow jersey now. Every going according to plan that Wiggins looks very very cool today this has been a good passage through the start of our journey through the Pyrenees tomorrow shouldn't be a problem but the next two days after our rest day on Tuesday they're the high mountains well the first two riders in the best young rider competition are also in this group because there is uh, Thibaut Pino on the right hand side there and just on his wheel is TJ Van Garderen the American with the Dutch sounding name Izagi at the back Sagan at the front Kassar in the middle these are the three riders now from the original group of 11 who are fleeing for the finish yeah, Peter Sagan uh, will now find that he's got some allies in this group because uh, three is a much better chance of getting a victory for the other two guys if they don't allow Sanchez and Gilbert to come back but I have a feeling that Gilbert and Sanchez may well come back into that leading group because they're still only about 10 seconds behind a little bit disappointing with the peloton here because nobody has hit out at Bradley Wiggins on this climb Maybe they can't, maybe these two pacemakers have actually broken down those favourites and they can't go any quicker now. So as we see uh, Richie Port, then Chris Froome, then Bradley Wiggins go over the top, we'll take a break and then we'll take these boys through to the finish, at least the boys up front. Well welcome back and this has just happened as they're coming up to the top of the Mur de Peguerre. It looks as though we've got Cadell Evans standing on the roadside. 
Well, I don't know what happened there. It was a flat back tyre at the top of the climb, but Phil, the team cars are so far behind because there's a lot of riders that have been well. dropped. And in fact, the Mavic team car then all of a sudden has stopped and he hasn't even got a teammate near him to change. This is amazing. This is not deserved as the riders are going over the summit. Cadell Evans is left standing there, a very lonely figure indeed, waving at everybody who approaches. He's seen a teammate coming up now and the teammate's got his wheel out uh, straight away as he gets Steve Cummings, in fact, who's giving him a wheel. But now we've got but two riders in trouble. Well, I really don't know. I've very, this is unbelievable. Where are the rest of his teammates, Phil? This is the problem with Cadell Evans' teammates. He's got so many guys who are great on the flat. Here's a quick, absolute pandemonium on board BMC Racing. Well, a minute has ticked by uh, Cadell Evans. It's all downhill, but to bridge a minute now, this I don't think is possible. Look at this now. The teammates with the other teammate is Amael Moyar come to the right. He seems to have a problem as well. And there's two we left to. Now we've got Cummings going away with him. Well, that's Hinkapi. No, it's not. George that's Hinkapi Hinkapi. going with him. Well, Hinkapi stopped at the side of the road there, waited for Evans. And I think Evans needs to wait for Hinkapi because he will be a great assistance on the descent. Well, that's a real shame. So, Cadell Evans now checking out the back wheel he's just put in. We reckon he's oh, over a, crash a minute at the behind. Side of the road. Somebody was down from Astana. I heard them say there was a crash. I didn't see it happen. Once again, Phil, a bit of excitement and chaos in the tour. Amazing. It should happen just there as we look here at Maxime Bouet's come through. Now, this is Wiggins now talking to the riders, trying to sort things out at the front. He knows about the chaos at the back. Is he saying, let's hang back for Cadell? What do you reckon? I have no idea what is going on at the moment. Cadell Evans has lost over a minute, but you know what? Heimar Zubeldia has just had a flat tyre as well. He's the best place rider from Radio Shack in sixth place overall. What has but he was that? given his wheel to, a, to uh, given a it's, wheel by a teammate. But the peloton's freewheeling here. It's almost as if there might have been a situation on the road there that caused all these problems. I don't know, but it looks to me as though Wiggins as the race leader is backing the pace off yeah but Pierre Roland is not he wants to have a little bit of action here ah, this Pierre afternoon he speaks French yeah he's not heard what uh, the rest of the guys said they're gonna let him go well, and he's uh, launching an attack I mean, with the leaders we're now under 20 kilometers from the finish the gap is 15 and a half minutes still going up there is a re another a repair there on the far side of the road it's Goodell now desperate moments oh, the mechanic can't control. even get up at this Jim Okovich who <laughs> can't even get up out of the ditch it's so slippery well they're taking an awful lot of time uh, it happens when you get the panic wow. situation like this uh, Evans is back up again and he's there the uh, leader of the king of the mountains classification is there in that group that's probably going to have cost him Phil a good uh, one and a half minutes now if you add the minute at the stop top to the 30 seconds he had to change there well, as Pierre Roland has launched an attack off the front of the Wiggins bunch here, Team Sky are organising themselves behind him to try and chase him down, I would suspect. Over 15 minutes on the leaders who are heading down into the flatter roads on the outskirts of what they have 19 kilometres to ride. Yeah, Phil, I've got a... F I don't know if I'm coming up with a conspiracy theory here, but there are so many flat tyres. I wonder if somebody's thrown something onto the road. Well, the thought has crossed my mind. I can't believe it. Why on earth would they do that? here in the Ariège I don't know uh, but they're trying to reorganize themselves Sagan is totally unaware of what's going on he's trying to win the stage it would be his fourth victory keeps the pressure on but the chase by Philippe Gilbert and by Luis Leon Sanchez is having an effect because they're coming back we're gonna have five men leading soon but, uh, there's nothing but the race referee shouting out flat tyre, flat tyre at the side of the road. There's a lot of problems with tyres. I don't know if it's the road surface or if there was actually something on the road here this afternoon. Pierre Roland, winner of the stage to La Toussuire, he's taking off on his own. Cadell Evans is currently two minutes behind the, uh, the yellow jersey group. Well, Pierre Roland, as he goes clear here, the, he sits ninth overall. At we're hearing now of another uh, for a Saxo Bank rider also had a flat tyre there's got to be a reason there wouldn't be this many of flat tyres coming over the top of that climb because there's another flat tyre being called from the car now for a Rabobank rider Team Sky are just organising the race at the front Pierre Roland as they can uh, 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 it's Pierre Rowland sits ninth overall, he's got a couple of minutes gain, he will go up into the top five or six riders in the tour, so he's every reason to push on. 
Well, I think just at the front of this group, this is the Cadell Evans group here, Phil. They're the fourth group on the road. He's got George Hincapie up alongside him to try and pace him into the bike race here this afternoon. Evans, who started the day in fourth place overall, looking for three minutes and 19 seconds. He's now very, very much on the defensive, but he's got a lot of teammates along him. Well, Sagan still trying to... I'm just listening to the race radio book. And in fact, they're screaming flat tyres all over the place and trying to get cars organised. This is absolutely uh, a most unfortunate situation, to put it mildly, for Cadell Evans and why his teammate, Philippe Gilbert, trying to handle it. These boys are not racing, I would suggest. They are continuing forward. All the favourites who are still riding are riding together. Uh, let's have a look how it all seemed to start. Cadell Evans, of all the people, gets a flat tide. He's in this front group of the peloton. Right, centre, left there. And all of a sudden he realises something's wrong with his back wheel. Watch it. He looks over to the right. He stops immediately. Jumps off his bike, but of course... Jürgen Vandenbroek, just behind him, has seen the problem of the flat tyre to Cadell. These are the riders going down the mountain now as uh, riders all over the place. This is the race for first place, by the way. 16 and a half kilometers to go now, just over 10 miles to the finish. Sandy Kassar here still in the hunt, but so too is the green jersey. That we're hearing, a, a, we're well. hearing a call. We're hearing a call from Sky for, Sky for Wiggins. Now our cameras go where uh, we have no control. Uh, there's the leaders on the descent at the moment. It's a rear wheel for Wiggins. He's also punctured. There's, there he is at the bottom of the group there. Sky car with the blue stripe waiting to get through to him. I think he's actually just calling his car up. That was a flat tyre for a Radio Shack rider actually, Phil. I think he's calling the team management forward because he wants to have a word with Sean Yates, the team manager. Well, let's have a look. Uh, Wiggins dropping back to the team car. This is amazing, the race leader falling back when they Pierre Roland is pushing home his advantage off the front of this group. It isn't a flat tyre, Paul, you're right. He's just, or is it? I'm well, not sure. I think he has got a flat tyre. He's just told them he wants a rear wheel. Well, they're actually going to take his bike off. You see the mechanic sits on the right-hand side of the car because he gets out of there very quickly, comes up alongside the, the team leader. The leader has a very quick change, that very well thought out. There was no panic on board the Skytrain. So uh, this is incredible in the closing kilometres of the day which looks so routine, bunch at one end, a breakaway at the front end and the race leaders are in all sorts of a bother here at the moment. Immediately a teammate up alongside him, that looked very much like the shape of Richie Port to me, it he was, will have stopped as was. soon as he got his uh, problem at the side of the road and now he will try and pace him back into the race. Well in case you've forgotten there's still a race for first place in Foix and these are the three leaders here. Well, that was indeed uh, Richie Port, who's come back to try and help him. This is the situation when I heard on the radio, it's, it's all in French on the radio, by the way, and Wiggins shouting for a rear wheel, the referees are anyway, not Wiggins, as he free wheels. But obviously they chose a bike change quicker than a wheel change, and that was probably the wisest thing to do. Now they come together, Frank Schleck at the front, a little smile on his face, the peloton freewheeling, uh, waiting the return of Wiggins, that's the gentlemanly thing to do just now I suspect. Poor old Cadell Evans uh, doesn't have the privilege of that, he was left standing around too long at the back of the race. So 16 minutes, the gap has gone up with the leaders, five of them are now together again on the descent. And Peter Sagan, in the green jersey, the sprinter, is still with them after two goals. Well, the funny thing is, Phil, I, I am wondering if somebody has thrown something onto the roads. I do know that many, many years ago in the old Tour de France history in the 1920s and 1930s, they actually was. threw tacks onto the road. And I wonder if somebody's done that this afternoon because I cannot understand well, why there are so many flat tyres in the space of five kilometres. Obviously, it'll come out uh, only overnight in the press, but uh, certainly it seems strange. But uh, unfortunately, it picked out the best riders in the Tour de France, which has to be an amazing coincidence. 
Yeah, well, anyway, uh, Cadell Evans is still around about a minute behind, but he's got uh, three teammates with him. One of those is George Hincapie. This is the group Evans. Uh, they're at 17 minutes and 17 seconds, so they're now filled probably only about 45 seconds behind yep. the yellow jersey group. And I am certain that uh, Wiggins will keep that group freewheeling until the chase group rejoins the pack and they'll come home together in the same time. So just a reminder fans that today's commercial free stage is brought to you by Nissan and the 2013 Nissan Altima. And uh, what an amazing period it is in today's stage of the Tour Advance. Look, the leaders are freewheeling, they are waiting for Cadell Evans to come back. Well there you are Paul, there's no doubt, it's all go slow, they're waiting for the Evans group to return. And then they will set off in pursuit of Pierre Roland, because Pierre Roland at the moment is a minute and 40 seconds ahead of the Wiggins group. He's in 8th place in the overall standing, as that 1 minute and 40 seconds will have him move up into 8th place overall. But uh, if they made a decision, uh, and it seems to be as if it was a joint decision, to wait for Cadell Evans to come back into the main field, they will chase down Pierre Roland with a well, vengeance. It's, uh, well, yes, he's 19 seconds up the road. In fact, he's only 10 seconds up the road at the moment, uh, Roland. 1 minute 50, 1 minute 50 is the gap, <laughs> the computer's going wrong there. Well, anyway, the leaders, by the way, uh, under, where are they? They're at 12 kilometres to go at the moment. I think we've had a few gremlins in the computer today because it's are. been upside down. Well, Maybe I'm not surprised. It's been rather busy, hasn't it? <laughs> yeah. So we're looking now at uh, the green jersey, there are five riders in the lead and these five riders are going to fight out the finish in about 12 kilometres time in the town of Foix. The group Cadell Evans is chasing back to the yellow jersey group of Wiggins oh, he stopped again. and as we cut to live pictures again Evans is stopping for a third time that looked like a front wheel this time. Well there is a lot of riders Phil have had multiple flat tyres Maxi Montfort had a front and back flat tyre Cadell Evans has had the well, same this is there's another flat tyre at the side yeah. of this is chaos. It has to be um, something causing those tyres it's got to be something like tax on the road there's no way they would pick up these problems uh, normally on the, a road like this well uh, they're reporting uh, over race radio Phil that uh, Robert Kizilowski is probably out of the Tour de France he's been taken to hospital with a suspected broken collarbone now this is a good move this is the only way to beat Peter Sagan Luis Leon Sanchez has gone alone well done uh, Luis Leon he's made his move 11 and a half kilometers to ride though uh, yes the town of Foix but we're not quite home yet well, he knew that this was what he had to do and this was the only way these guys are going to beat Peter Sagan this afternoon because if you take the rider from Slovakia to the finish line, he will show you a clean pair of wheels. So the situation, 11 kilometres out from the finish, Luis Leon Sanchez attacks his group of five. Cadell Evans is having the nightmare ride of his life. No, he certainly... Anyway, Paul, 16.51, 10.8 kilometres to go. Well, Go on. Luis Leon Sanchez, he's picked the right moment and he's the kind of rider who can survive. He chased all the way from the top of the final climb and now he's got himself a 15 second advantage. Who is going to work though with Peter Sagan? Well, that is a very good question because they know they'll take the winner up to the leader. Yep, well, he's got to the back of that group. They're trying to get themselves organised. You can see the arm uh, gestures there coming from Sandy Kassar. Amazingly enough, he's been in the breakaway in the Tour de France uh, throughout history three times with this man that he's looking at here, Luis Leon Sanchez. On two occasions, Sanchez has got the win and Sandy Kassar has finished second. On one occasion, it was the other way around. Well, our computer is saying that the Cadell Evans group, if he's still with a group of any sort, is one minute behind the Wiggins group that's trying to wait for him and that uh, Pierre Roland who attacked, and I think innocently attacked, doesn't know what's going on, he's nearly two minutes ahead of the Wiggins group. We are looking at the leaders now, or the, chasing the leader, 10 kilometres to go now for the four riders chasing Luis Leon Sanchez. Well, it's been, I just saw another rider stop at the side of the road with a flat tyre, it looked did. very much as if that was the, uh, the Ukrainian national champion. Well, they certainly called him, but they didn't call his name, because I think he caught them off guard in the cars behind as well. Whatever it is, he's working through all of the time. We're looking on the back wheel here of uh, Michele Scarponi, the former winner of the Tour of Italy in that mauve jersey. Well, this is uh, Lotto Belisol now trying to get a little bit of organisation at the front end of the main field. 
Now is he racing or is he waiting? That's the question because that was the Wiggins group just there. Anyway, we're back up with the leader on the road here. Luis Leon Sanchez made a brilliant move, an absolutely typical attack. Has he got the strength to go all of the way? He tried it for the first time as they came up to the top of the Mur de Peguer. Well, he's trying there, Phil. He's got together. You know, he's still he's dragged out a few more seconds. It's 18 seconds. They are working now in this group behind. They're trying to pull him back. You know, when you've been away in a bike race like the Tour de France, you can't throw away a stage victory like this one. But one man is great in the solo effort, and that, of course, is Luis Leon Sanchez. Yeah. If anybody can pull this off, it's him. He's the champion of uh, Spain in the time trial. He's won it for the last two years. Let's have a look at the gap. He's paying off at the moment. It's, it's pulled out nicely as uh, he comes to eight and a half kilometers from the finish. Now Sagan, uh, we're seeing the race slip away from him. He's got to help these three other riders, uh, even though it might blunt his sprint a little bit. They're now placed on the defensive as the Spanish rider on the Dutch Rabobank squad, and they're desperate for a stage win this tour. 19 seconds is the advantage. He's using all of the power that he can muster, and they, we have said he's a great individual time trialist, but he's got to time trial away from four riders who are collaborating and who have proved to us that they were the strongest riders in that breakaway group this morning. We are looking now at Luis Leon Sanchez. He made his move just before 10 kilometers to go. He's 7.9 kilometers from the end. The gap is beginning to grow. The man that limped throughout the first week of the tour, Paul, with his damaged wrist and sat last man for almost a week has now come good. Well, he has, and that's a good sign for Himmler for the upcoming Olympic Games because he's one of the pre-race favorites for the individual time trial, and he will participate in the row race as well. They're 23 seconds behind him now Sagan gets down into that very dangerous and precarious and low profile position of his just to find a little extra speed Sam, uh, Luis Leon Sanchez almost said Samuel Sanchez but we lost him sadly uh, earlier injuries in the top this is Luis Leon Sanchez no relation as he pushes on now he'll take the shortest slice of road he can find here as he races towards the finish this is the group here now being driven on by Lotto it could be Adam Hansen on the front there at the moment, uh, but did they wait for Cadell Evans? And I don't think they did. And the decision now is to chase down Pierre Rowland. As we look at the time gap, 16.51, we're looking at four chasing riders here. Uh, Peter Sagan is the rider in green, Izegir, and also Sandy Kassar, Philippe Gilbert. But this man chose a little rise on the road on the outskirts of Foix to take his chance, and his gap is growing. This is such a terrific piece of time trial riding by time trial champion of Spain this past two years. Sanchez now is going to find it's not all downhill to the finishing line. Oh, and what's happened here? Boy, Ooh. that was lucky by Philippe Gilbert. Good job, he's a good bike handler going around that corner. He had to change his line and he almost went straight into the right rider in front of him. Now he's back in the bike, getting himself organised. But Luis Leon Sanchez, Phil, is doing the job this afternoon because he's 29 seconds ahead of the four chasers. That may be enough. Uh, we can't find the location yet of uh, Cadell Evans. We're looking at it now, though. This is the drive, and all of Team BMC have now organised themselves on a driving on. They're trying to bridge to the Wiggins group. Uh, I'm just trying to work out how far they are, about a minute behind. Yeah, no, a little bit less than that. It's a yeah, 40 a less, seconds. Yeah. They're actually starting to eat into that advantage. But what they will have to do then is chase down Pierre Rolland because he's 1 minute and 53 seconds ahead of the main field. And in fact, in ninth place at the start of the day, he could be starting to threaten the position of Heimar Zubeldi and, of course, Jürgen Vandenbroek. No, the chase is certainly on now. 20 kilometers to go for the Evans group. They're 41 seconds behind the Wiggins group, which is in turn trying to bridge a gap of two minutes to Roland on his own. Well, I have to say, Cadell Evans are very lucky there because he's got a strong team for the flat races like this and he's trying to pull himself back into the Tour de France this afternoon because uh, with the loss of a minute, he could drop down into fifth or sixth place overall and get overtaken by Jürgen Vandenbroek. Well, you know, TJ Van Garden also on the team, VMC team, Evans shouted and I don't think he heard as they crossed the top of the last call, so he should be alongside Wiggins at the front and he must be wondering where on earth uh, at the moment the BMC uh, are behind. He would do no work up front, he'd be hoping 
that they'll cross the gap very, very short, and they should. Well, there's only 27 seconds now between the Cadell Evans group and the group of the yellow jersey and Bradley Wiggins, but there's still two minutes difference between Pierre Roland and the Wiggins group of the yellow jersey. Yes, exactly two minutes. For the leaders, four kilometers, a leader, four kilometers to go. Here he is, Luis Leon Sanchez, looking for his fourth win in the Tour de France throughout time. Yep, and I think he's going to get it this afternoon, Phil, because he stretched out a few more seconds, 33 seconds over the chasers. He will survive. He doesn't look like a man is going to crack in the last four kilometres of this bike race here this afternoon, and he's still pounding a massive gear in the outskirts of Foix. It will be very difficult because the terrain is in the favour of the attacker now. Gently downhill will drop into Foix itself, which is a beautiful town. But the drama around the foothills of the Pyrenees today, and that story will run, I think, when we find out what has caused those that flurry of punctures right on the top of the Mur de Peguerre. Well, this is uh, Michael Shah coming forward now. He's uh, hammering away at the front end of this group. They have all rallied around Cadell Evans, and this again is one thing we've always said. To win the Tour de France, you need a team. You need a team of riders around you because you cannot win it as an individual. 23 seconds. Cadell Evans is now behind the group we're watching here, which is being driven now by Liquid Gas Canada. Then we, the chase is now very, very close. It's come back. It's even less now. Oh, it's gone out a little bit. Sorry, Paul. It's gone out to 30 seconds now since Liquid Gas got themselves onto the front. Three kilometres to go. The kilometres are popping off at about one minute, ten seconds a kilometre. That makes uh, Luis Leon Sanchez now very, very close to home. Well, he's heading to what is down the road one a kilometer from the finish for Luis Leon Sanchez tricky old final kilometer but it doesn't matter he's on his own here only got to worry about a right hand turn over the river bridge and then he heads up to the finishing line and it's going to be his fourth victory in the Tour de France since 2008 well you know Phil he'd been looking for this one he nursed his body through the first week of the Tour de France he was injured like many many other riders he sat in last position a flat of Spain over there on the right hand side Pierre Roland is about to get caught now are they going to say anything when they pick him up or will they sit up as they come up behind Pierre Roland I wonder if he's been told to wait for the peloton they're not looking at him no they're uh, getting down to the job in hand here this afternoon and I have a funny feeling that all of a sudden Lotto and uh, Liquigas have decided they want to leave Cadell Evans behind because Cadell Evans he and his team are doing a phenomenal job he's now only about 20 seconds behind the tail end of the Wiggins group yes well done he's saluting the crowd at the front here now Luis Leon Sanchez he knows he's won that was to his team management behind he's now given Rabobank a team a victory they've lost three, uh, uh, four of their riders already in the Tour de France including their race leader Robert Hessing in fact they've lost five so they've only got four men left in the Tour de France Two of them were in the breakaway today. The other one was Stephen Kreiswick. Now he comes home to the cheers of the crowd. What a last uh, 20 kilometres we have seen today. Tax on the road. But this man has given Rabobank now a real Philip in the Tour de France. Luis Leon Sanchez, he won in Aurillac, saint Giron, which is down the road, saint Flor last year. Now he can add Foix to his list. Well, the funny thing, Phil, is it's a 2008, 2009. He missed out 2010, but uh, he won nearly every year. He wins a stage at the Tour de France. And to do so, he had to outwit that man there in the green jersey, who will now be sprinting for points in a mountain stage. Surely he's got the green jersey yeah. competition wrapped up with this day. Absolutely. It's been an incredible day out. Peter Sagan was the man who started the breakaway today. He went away on his own. The rest joined him. He's an absolutely formidable rider in the Tour de France and this is one of many years to come he's staring them in the face he's waiting for them to start and he's going to beat Philippe Gilbert without any serious effort Gilbert is on the right about the wheel was coming off the ground there from Sagat but look at that a clear length that's why he would have won if he had come home with Luis Leon Sanchez well you know Luis Leon Sanchez did the best thing possible there by attacking him the way he did I'm just looking at the main field. It looks like the main field have uh, cut off the chaser fraction. I'm having a quick look. Cadell Evans is not more than 15 seconds now, Phil, off the back end of this group. They've shut down Paul. They've picked up Pierre Roland, and I think that they've actually shut down to await the return of Cadell Evans. 
so the top bike riders in the Tour de France have neutralized the race because of whatever happened out on the mountain and apparently according to French radio tax thrown on the road of the Tour de France today well uh, you know that was an amazing thing there's Cadell Evans coming back through there they've put they're their hands out they're thanking the riders I think thanking the team cars because they know it will be the directors of the team there who will have told the boys to step sit back and let Cadell Evans back on well done this man however it did he was not involved in anything it was a brilliant ride today by Luis Leon Sanchez no a perfect ride and a perfect attack on the run in towards the finish that's the uh, chateau which has perched just above the city of Foix but today has been a rather interesting day in the Tour de France once again for the wrong reasons yes I think so so as we look here at uh, Luis Leon Sanchez now going behind to make ready for the uh, prize presentation but of course it'll be a little wait because they've still got 15 minutes for the main field to come in before they can start those presentations uh, as uh, Cadell has now joined in the group as we saw him coming up the outside now this is uh, Paulinho at the back here and this is also Mina they were up there at the front so they paid the price on the plan they're still racing though this will be for 6th and 7th place on the day. And Sergio Paulinho, who has won one stage of the Tour de France and a silver medal in an Olympic Games road race in Athens. He is a good sprinter when he wants to be, and so he's cleaned up uh, that pace. He used to be on the uh, Radio Shack team alongside uh, the Americans. So Paulinho in, and uh, Sebastian Minard of AG2R there. Now we're looking down from the helicopter, we've gone up the road by about 14 minutes and uh, now you can see Cadell Evans talking now with Bradley Wiggins. Well that is a great sporting gesture and it had to be done. Uh, it's really unfortunate to try and move up the overall standard because of sabotage but you see what the main field did, they waited for Cadell Evans and then they went out and they pulled back Pierre Roland with the, uh, the threat to Jürgen Vandenbroek's place in the overall standards. He was starting to threaten the top five riders. Oh, looks like it's uh, fair use trying to finish off the day here Wiggins comes round that corner get round it safely as they have their line up for the line the crowd start applauding here as they come home as a quite a big bunch at the end of a mounting stage of the Tour de France and they're keeping their head down they're making a sprint for the crowd it doesn't matter they will all receive at the same time here as they come up the line look at that time Phil 18 and a quarter minutes uh, Cadell Evans and Bradley Wiggins are finishing all with the same time so there will be no change in the top 10 in the overall standings probably not even the top 15 at the end of the day tonight serious look on the face of Cadell Evans as he came over the line there but the man who won Luis Leon Sanchez he can now uh, he's pulled on a dry racing jersey already he can now get ready for his presentation he'll be up first as the stage winner as uh, the whole field now are coming in as we look around this beautiful this is the castle of the Counts of Foix looking down high above the finishing line today by the way we can see it out of our commentary window hey, Louis Leon Sanchez gets his fourth win in history in the Tour de France Sagan second this time brilliant score points for him Sandy Cassa third Philippe Gilbert fourth and Gorka Izaguirre fifth those five deciding the day as they broke clear on the top of the last climb of the day, the Mieux de Peguier. Looking further down, the rest of the breakaway, uh, 2.51 later in came Paulinho, outsprinting Mina, 3.49 later Martin Velitz, 4.51 later Eduard Morganov, champion of Russia, 4.53 Stephen Kreisweich, who set up his mate uh, Sanchez to break away earlier. And there's one rider, we're not showing the 11th rider, but the 11th rider came in just under 15 minutes later, and that was Cyril Gautier, who got the, the uh, 11th place today.